Chapter 11 On the Hierarchical Relationship Between Royalty and Priesthood If on the one hand the original synthesis of the two powers is reestablished in the person of the consecrated king, on the other hand, the nature of the hierarchical relationships existing in every normal social order between royalty and priestly caste or church, which is merely the mediator of supernatural influences, is very clearly defined. Regality enjoys primacy over the priesthood, just as, symbolically speaking, the sun has primacy over the moon and the man over the woman. In a certain sense, this is the same primacy over Abraham's priesthood that was traditionally attributed to the priestly regality of Melchizedek, who performed sacrifices in the name of the Almighty, the God of victory, God Most High, delivered your foes into your hand, Genesis 14.20. As I have said, the medieval apologists of the Gibel and Yil occasionally referred to the symbol of Melchizedek when laying claim, over and against the church, to the privileges and to the supernatural dignity of the monarchy. When referring to thoroughly traditional civilizations, it is helpful to employ Aryan or Indo-Aryan texts in order to emphasize that even in a civilization that appears to be characterized mainly by the priestly caste, the notion of the correct relationship between the two dignities was preserved to a large extent. In these texts, which I have previously quoted, it is said that the stock of the warrior deities arose from Brahman as a higher and more perfect form than Brahman itself. Letting on, this is why nothing is greater than the warrior nobility, Katram, the priest, Brahmana, themselves venerate the warrior when the consecration of the king occurs. In the same text, the priestly caste that was assimilated to that Brahman, understood here in an impersonal manner and in an analogous sense to what in Christianity is considered to be the power, or donimus, of the Holy Spirit, which is in its safekeeping, was represented as a mother or as a maternal matrixia in relation to the warrior or regal caste. This is particularly meaningful. The regal type is presented here according to its value as male principle, which surpasses, individuates, masters, and rules triumphantly over the spiritual force, which is conceived of as a mother and as a female. Reference was made to ancient traditions concerning a type of regality that was attained by marrying a divine woman, often portrayed as a mother. This symbolizes incest, whereby the Egyptian king, in a broader context, was given the title of his mother's bull. We are led again to the same point. Therefore, even when the right of investiture is considered necessary, this does not establish or acknowledge the subordination of the king per se to the priestly caste. After the race of beings who are by nature more than mere human beings became extinct, a king was, prior to his consecration, simply a warrior, provided that he did individually rise to something higher through other means. But in the rite of consecration the king, rather than receiving, assumes a power that the priestly class does not own but rather has in custody. This power is then supposed to rise to a higher form that it did not possess before. Also, in consecration, the virile and warrior quality of the person to be initiated frees itself and rises to a higher plane. It then acts as an axis or as a pull of the sacred force. This is why the officiating priest must worship the king whom he consecrates. All of the latter, according to a text, owes to the Brahman and the respect owed to a mother. In the Manidharam Shastra itself, although the primacy of the Brahman is upheld, the latter is compared to the water and to the stone, while the Kshatri is compared to the fire and to iron. The text goes on to say that rulers do not prosper without priests and priests do not thrive without rulers, and that the priest is said to be the root of the law, and the ruler is the peak, odd as it may seem, these ideas originally were not totally alien to Christianity itself. According to the testimony of Eginard, after Charlemagne was consecrated and hailed with the formula, long life and victory to Charles the Great, crowned by God, great and peaceful emperor of the Romans. The Pope prostrated himself, and I do I would, before Charles, according to the ritual established at the time of the ancient emperors. In the time of Charlemagne and of Lou the Pious, as in the time of the Christian, Roman, and Byzantine emperors, the ecclesiastical councils were summoned, authorized, and presided over by the prince, to whom the bishops presented the conclusions they had reached, not only in matters of discipline but in matters of faith and doctrine as well, with the formula, O Lordship and Emperor. May your wisdom integrate what is found lacking, correct what is against reason. Almost as in an echo this bears witness to the fact that the ancient primacy and an undeniable authority over the priesthood, even in matters of wisdom, was attributed to the ruler. The liturgy of power, typical of a primordial tradition, still subsists.
It was not a pagan, but Bassa, a Catholic bishop, 1627 to 1704, who declared in modern times that the sovereign is the image of God on earth and who exclaimed, You are divine though you are subject to death, and your authority does not die. When the priestly caste, however, by virtue of the consecration that it administers demands that the regal authority should recognize the hierarchical superiority of the priesthood unquestionably, a lesser person is blessed by a greater, Hebrew 7 7, and be subjected to it, such was, in Europe, the church claimed during the struggle for the invested. This amounts to a full blown heresy, totally subversive of traditional truths. In reality, as early as in the dark ages of prehistory we can detect the first episodes of the conflict between regal and priestly authority, since they both claimed for themselves the primacy that belongs to what is prior and superior to each of them. Contrary to common opinion, in the beginning this contrast was not motivated at all by a yearning for political hegemony. The cause of this conflict had a deeper root into opposing spiritual attitudes. According to the prevalent form, he was destined to assume after the differentiation of dignities. The priest is by definition always an interpreter and a mediator of the divine. As powerful as he may be, he will always be aware of addressing God as his Lord. The sacred king, on the other hand, feels that he belongs to the same stock as the gods. He ignores the feeling of religious subordination and cannot help but be intolerant of any claim to supremacy advanced by the priesthood. Later times witnessed the emergence of forms of an anti-traditional anarchy that was manifested mainly into ways. If there is a royalty that is a mere temporal power in rebellion against spiritual authority, or is a spirituality of a lunar character in rebellion against a spirituality embodied by kings who were still aware of their ancient function. In both instances, heterodoxy was destined to emerge from the ruins of the traditional world. The first path will lead to the hegemony of the political element, the secularization of the idea of the state, the destruction of every authentic hierarchy, and last but not least, to the modern forms of an illusory and materialistic virility and power that are destined to be swept away by the power of the world of the masses in its collectivist versions. The second path will run parallel to the first. It will initially be manifested through the advent of the civilization of the mother and through its pantheist spirituality, and later on through the varieties of what constitutes devotional religion. The Middle Ages were the theater of the last great episode in the above-mentioned conflict between the religious universalism represented by the church and the regal ideal, embodied, though not without some compromises, in the Holy Roman Empire. According to the regal ideal, the emperor is really the caput colossi, not in the sense that he takes the place of the head of the priestly hierarchy, the pope, but in the sense that only in the imperial function may the force that is represented by the church and that animates Christianity efficaciously impose its dominion. In this context, the world, portrayed as a vast unitary whole represented by the church, was perceived as a body in which the single members are coordinated under the supreme direction of the emperor, who is at the same time the leader of the realm and of the church. The emperor, although he was constituted as such by the right of investiture that followed the other invested relative to his secular aspect of Teutonic prince, claimed to have received his right and his power directly from God and claimed to acknowledge only God above himself. Therefore the role of the head of the priestly hierarchy who had consecrated him could logically be only that of a mere mediator, unable, according to the Ghibelin ideal, to revoke by means of excommunication the supernatural force with which the emperor had been endowed. Before the Gregorian interpretation subverted the very essence of the ancient symbols, the old tradition was upheld in lieu of the fact that the empire had always and everywhere been compared to the sun as the church had been compared to the moon. Moreover, even at the times of her highest prestige, the church attributed to herself an essentially feminine symbolism, that of a mother in relation to the king, whom she viewed as her son. The Upanishad's designation, the Brahmana as the mother of the Ksatriam, appears again in the symbolism, this time in concomitance with the supremacist fancies of a gincrocratic civilization marked by an anti rogue subordination of the son to the mother and by an emphasis on the mother's privileges. After all, based on what I have discussed so far, it is clear that the very assumption of the title of Pontifex Maximus by the head of the Christian religion, the Pope, turned out to be more or less a usurpation, since Pontifex Magnus was originally a function of the King and of the Roman Augustus. Likewise, the characteristic symbols of the papacy, the double keys in the ship, were borrowed from the ancient Roman cult of Janus. The papal tiar itself derives from a dignity that was not religious or priestly, but essentially initiatory and from the dignity proper of the Lord of the Center or of the Sovereign of the Three Worlds.
In all this, we can visibly detect a distortion and an abusive shift of dimension that, although they occurred in a hidden way, are nevertheless real and testify to a significant deviation from the pure traditional ideal. Chapter 12. Universality and Centralism the ideal of the Holy Roman Empire points out the decadence the principle of regular ruling is liable to undergo when it loses its spiritual foundation. I will here anticipate some of the ideas I intend to develop in the second part of this work. In the Gibbon ideal of the Holy Roman Empire, the beliefs were firmly upheld that the Rangdom had a supernatural origin and a metapolitical and universal nature, and that the Emperor as the Lexinum ad Interis and as the peak of the Ordinato ad Unum, was al quad unum quad non as pars, Dante, and the representative of a power transcending the community he governed. In the same way, the empire should not be confused with any of the kingdoms and nations that it encompassed, since in principle it was something qualitatively other, prior, and superior to each of them. There was no inconsistency, as some historians would have us believe, in the medieval contrast between the absolute right, above all places, races, and nations, the emperor claimed for himself by virtue of having been regularly invested and consecrated, and the practical limitations of his material power vis a vis the European sovereigns who owed him obedience. The nature of the plane of every universal function that exercises an all-encompassing unifying action is not a material one. As long as such a function does not assert itself as a mere material unity and power, it is worthy of its goals. Ideally speaking, the various kingdoms were not supposed to be united to the empire through a material bond, whether of a political or a military nature, but rather through an ideal and spiritual bond, which was expressed by the characteristic term fides, which in medieval Latin had both the religious meaning and the political and moral meaning of faithfulness or devotion. The fides elevated to the dignity of a sacrament, sacramentum to dilatitis, and the principle of all honor was the cement that unified the various feudal communities. Faithfulness bound the feudal lord to his prince, who was himself a feudal lord of a higher rank. Moreover, in a higher, purified, and immaterial form, faithfulness was the element required to bring back these partial units, single common test, to the center of gravity of the empire, which was superior to them all since it enjoyed such a transcendent power and authority that it did not need to resort to arms in order to be acknowledged. This is also why, in the feudal and imperial Middle Ages, as well as in any other civilization of a traditional type, unity and hierarchy were able to coexist with a high degree of independence, freedom, and self-expression. Generally speaking and especially in typically Aryan civilizations, there were long periods of time in which a remarkable degree of pluralism existed within every state, or city, families, stocks, and made up any small-scale states and powers that enjoyed autonomy to a large degree. They were subsumed in an ideal and organic unity, though they possessed everything they needed for their material and spiritual life, a cult, a law, a land, and a militia. Tradition, the common origin, and the common race, not just the race of the body, but the race of the spirit, were the only foundations of a superior organization that was capable of developing into the form of the empire, especially when the original group of forces spread into a larger space when it needed to be organized and unified. A typical example is the early history of the Franks. Frank was synonymous with being free and the bearer, by virtue of one's race, of a dignity that in their own eyes made the Frank superior to all other people. Francus Lydicator, quae super omest alias decus et dominat illa debitor, Prinus. Up to the 9th century, sharing the common civilization of and belonging to the Frank stock were the foundations of the state. Although there was no organized and centralized political unity coextensive with the national territory as in the modern idea of a state. Later on, in the Carolingian development that led to establishment of the empire, Frank nobility was scattered everywhere. These separated and highly autonomous units, which still retained an immaterial connection with the center, constituted the unifying vital element within the overall connection, like cells of the nervous system in relation to the rest of the organism. The Far Eastern tradition in particular has emphasized the idea that by leaving the peripheral domain, by not intervening in a direct way, and by remaining in the essential spirituality of the center, like the hub of the wheel affecting its movement, it is possible to achieve the virtue that characterizes the true empire, as the single individuals maintain the feeling of being free and everything unfolds in an orderly way. This is possible because by virtue of the reciprocal compensation resulting from the invisible direction being followed, the partial disorders or individual wills will eventually contribute to the overall order. This is the basic idea behind any real unity and any authentic authority.
On the contrary, whenever we witness in history the triumph of a sovereignty and of a unity presiding over multiplicity in a merely material, direct, and political way, intervening everywhere, abolishing the autonomy of single groups, leveling in an absolutist fashion every right and every privilege, and altering and imposing a common will on various ethnic groups, then there cannot be any authentic imperial power since what we are dealing with is no longer an organism but a mechanism. This type is best represented by the modern national and centralizing states. Wherever a monarch has descended to such a lower plane, in other words, wherever he, in losing his spiritual function, has promoted an absolutism and a political and material centralization by emancipating himself from any bond owed to sacred authority, humiliating the feudal nobility, and taking over those powers that were previously distributed among the aristocracy, such a monarch has dug his own grave, having brought upon himself all into consequences. Absolutism is a short-lived mirage, the enforced uniformity paves the way for demagogy, the ascent of the people, or demast, to the desecrated throne. This is the case with tyranny, which in several Greek cities replaced the previous aristocratic, sacro regime. This is also somewhat the case with ancient Rome and with Byzantium in the leveling forms of the imperial decadence. And finally, this is the meaning of European political history after the collapse of the spiritual ideal of the Holy Roman Empire and the ensuing advent of the secularized, nationalist monarchies, up to the age of totalitarianism as a terminal phenomenon. It is hardly worth talking about the great powers that arose from the hypertrophy of nationalism that was inspired by a barbaric will to power of a militaristic or economic type in that people called empires. Let me repeat that an empire is such only by virtue of higher values that have been attained by a given race, which first of all had to overcome itself and its naturalistic particularities. Only then will a race become the bearer of a principle that is also present in other peoples endowed with a traditional organization, although this principle is present only in a potential form. In this instance, the conquering material action presents itself as an action that shatters the die of empirical separation and elevates the various potentialities to the one and only actuality, thus producing a real unification. The principle die and become, which resembles being hit by a Apollo's thunderbolt, seasteading, is the elementary requirement for every stock striving to achieve an imperial mission and dignity. This is exactly the opposite of the morality of so-called sacred selfishness displayed by various nations. To remain limited by national characteristics in order to dominate on their basis other peoples or other lands is not possible other than through a temporary violence. The hand, as such, cannot pretend to dominate the other organs of the body. It can do so, however, by ceasing to be a hand and by a becoming soul, or in other words, by rising up again to an immaterial function that is able to unify and to direct the multiplicity of the particular bodily functions, being superior to each one of them considered an end of themselves. If the imperialist adventures of modern times have failed miserably, often bringing to ruin the peoples that promoted them, or if they have been transformed into calamities of different kinds, the cause is precisely the absence of any authentically spiritual, metapolitical, and metanationalistic element that is replaced instead with the violence of a stronger power that nonetheless is of the same nature as those minor powers it attempts to subdue. If an empire is not a sacred empire, it is not an empire at all, but rather something resembling a cancer within a system comprised of the distinct functions of a living organism. This is what I think about the degeneration of the idea of rigor once it has become secularized and separated from the traditional spiritual basis. It is merely a temporal and centralizing idea. When considering yet another aspect of this deviation, one will notice that it is typical of all priestly castes to refuse to acknowledge the imperial function, as was the case of the Roman Church at the time of the struggle over the investit, and to aim at a deconsecration of the concept of state and of royalty. Thus, often without realizing it, the priestly caste contributed to the formation of that lay and realistic mentality that unavoidably was destined to rise up against priestly authority itself and to ban any of its effective intifi in the body of the state. After the fanaticism of the early Christian communities, which originally identified the ruling Caesar's empire with Satan's kingdom, the greatness of the Iternititis Romae with the opulence of the Babylonian prostitute, and the Lictorian conquest with the Magnum Latracinum, and after the Augustinian dualism, which contrasted state institutions with the Civitas Dei and considered the former as sinful corpus diable and unnatural devices, the Gregorian thesis eventually upheld the doctrine of the so-called natural right in the context of which regal authority was divested of every transcendent and divine character and reduced to a mere temporal power transferred to the king by the people.
According to this thesis, a king is always accountable to the people for his power, as every positive state law is declared contingent and revocable vis a vis that natural right. As early as the 13th century, once the Catholic doctrine of the sacraments was defined, regal anointing was discontinued and ceased to be considered, as it had been previously, almost on the same level as priestly ordination. Later on, the Society of Jesus often accentuated the anti-traditional lay view of royalty, even though they sided with the absolutism of those monarchies that were subservient to the church. The Jesuits in some cases went as far as legitimizing red, in order to make it clear that only the church enjoys a sacred character and that therefore every primacy belongs to her alone. As I've already mentioned, however, exactly the opposite came true. The spirit that was evoked overcame those who evoked it. Once the European states became the expressions of popular sovereignty and found themselves governed merely by economic principles and by the acephalous organizations, such as the Italian city republics, that the church had indirectly sponsored in their struggle against imperial authority, they became self-sustent entities. These entities eventually became increasingly secularized and relegated everything that had to do with religion to an increasingly abstract, privatistic, and secondary domain and even used religion as an instrument to pursue their own goals. The Guelph, Gregorian Thomist, views the expression of an emasculated spirituality to which a temporal power is superimposed from the outside in order to strengthen it and render it efficient. This view eventually replaced the synthesis of spirituality and power, of regal supernaturality and centrally typical of the pure traditional idea. The Thomist worldview attempted to correct such an absurdity by conceiving a certain continuity between state and church and by seeing in the state a providential institution. According to this view, the state cannot act beyond a certain limit. The church takes over beyond that limit as an eminently and directly supernatural institution by perfecting the overall socio-political order and by actualizing the goal that ex edit pro ortoi mediralis facultatis humanae. While this view is not too far off from traditional truth, it unfortunately encounters, in the order of ideas to which it belongs, an insurmountable difficulty represented by the essential difference in the types of relationship with the divine that are proper to regality and to priesthood respectively. In order for a real continuity, rather than a hiatus, to exist between the two successive degrees of a unitary organization, scholasticism identified them with state and church, it would have been necessary for the church to embody in the supernatural order the same spirit that the impi, strictly speaking, embodied on the material plane. This spirit is what I have called spiritual virility. The religious view typical of Christianity, however, did not allow for anything of this sort, from Pope Gelasius I onward, the church claim was that since Christ had come, nobody could be king and priest at the same time. Despite her hierocratic claims, the church has not embodied the virile, soul pole of the spirit, but the feminine, lunar pole. She may lay claim to the key but not to the scepter. Because of her role as mediatrix of the divine conceived eastically, and because of her view of spirituality as contemplative life essentially different from active life, not even Dante was able to go beyond this opposition. The church cannot represent the best integration of all particular organizations, that is to say, she cannot represent the pinnacle of a great, homogeneous ordinate laid only capable of encompassing both the peak and the essence of the providential design that is forvaded, according to the above-mentioned view, in single organic and hierarchical political units. If a body is free only when it obeys its soul, and not a heterogeneous soul, and we must give credit to Frederick II's claim, according to which the states that recognize the authority of the empire are free, while those states that submit to the church, which represents another spirituality, are the real slaves. Chapter 13. The Soul of Chivalry As I have previously indicated, not only regality but traditional nobility as well was originally characterized by a spiritual element. As we did for regality, let us consider the case in which this element is not the natural but rather the acquired possession of nobility. It follows that we find a gap analogous to that which exists between initiation and investiture. Investiture corresponds to what in the West was knightly ordination and to what in other areas was the ritual initiation typical of the warrior caste. Initiation, a realization of a more direct, individual, and in your nature, corresponds to heroic action in a traditional, sacra sense, which is connected to doctrines such as that of the Holy War and of the Mars Tromepolis. I will discuss the second possibility later. In this context, I will only discuss the spirit and the mystery of medieval knighthood as an example of the first possibility. To begin with, we must be aware of the difference that existed during the European Middle Ages between the feudal and knightly aristocracy, 
The former was connected to a land and to faithfulness vied to a given prince. Knighthood, instead, appeared as a super-territorial and supernational community in which its members, who were consecrated to military priesthood, no longer had a homeland and thus were bound by faithfulness not to people but, on the one hand, to an ethics that had as its fundamental values honor, truth, courage, and loyalty and, on the other hand, to a spiritual authority of a universal type, which was essentially that of the empire. Knighthood the great knightly orders of the Christian ecumeny were an essential part of the empire, since they represented the political and military counterpart of what the clergy and the monastic orders represented in the ecclesiastical order. Knighthood did not necessarily have a hereditary character. It was possible to become a knight as long as the person wishing to become one performed feats that could demonstrate both his heroic contempt for attachment to life as well as the above mentioned faithfulness, in both senses of the term. In the older versions of knightly ordination, a knight was ordained by another knight without the intervention of priests, almost as if in the warrior there was a force similar to a fluid that was capable of creating new knights by direct transmission. A witness to this practice is found in the Indo-Aryan tradition of warriors ordaining other warriors. Later on, a special religious rite was developed, aimed at ordaining knights. This is not all. There is a deeper aspect of European chivalry of mentioning. The knights dedicated their heroic deeds to a woman. This devotion assumed such extreme forms in European chivalry that we should regard them as an absurd and aberrant phenomenon, if taken literally. To avow unconditional faithfulness to a woman was one of the most recurrent themes in chivalrous groups. According to the theology of the castles, there was little doubt that a knight who died for his woman shared the same promise of blessed immortality achieved by a crusader who had died to liberate the temple. In this context, faithfulness to God and to a woman appear to coincide. According to some rituals, the neophyte knights, women had to undress him and led him to the water so that he could be purified before being ordained. On the other hand, the heroes of daring feats involving a woman, such as Tristan and Lancelot, are simultaneously knights of King Arthur committed to the quest for the grail, and members of the same order of heavenly knights to which the hyperborean Knight of the Swan belong. The truth is that behind all this there were esoteric meanings that were not disclosed to the judges of the Inquisition or to ordinary folks. Thus, these meanings were often conveyed in the guise of weird costumes and of erotic tales. In a number of instances, what has been said about the knights, woman also applies to the woman celebrated by the Gibbelin, Love's Liege, which points to a uniform and precise traditional symbolism. The woman to whom a knight swears unconditional faithfulness and to whom even a crusader consecrates himself. The woman who leads to purification, whom the knight considers his reward and who will make him immortal if he ever dies for her. That woman, as it has been documented in the case of the worshippers of love or love's liege, is essentially a representation of holy wisdom, or a perceived embodiment, in different degrees, of the transcendent, divine woman who represents the power of a transfiguring spirituality and of a life unaffected by death. This motif, in turn, is part of a complete traditional system. There is, in fact, a vast cycle of sagas and myths in which the woman is portrayed according to this value. The same theme runs through the stories of he, a perennial youth who becomes the spouse of the hero Heracles in the Olympian domain, of Ethan, whose name means rejuvenation, renewal, and of Gonlod, holder of the magic potion Adrir, who attempt in vain to attain Frey, goddess of light, who is constantly yearned for by elemental beings, Vrindhild, whom Odin appoints as the earthly bride of a hero who will dare go through the flickering flame surrounding her all, of the woman of the land of the living and of the victorious one, Bogud, who attracts the Gallic hero Kalnacha, of the Egyptian women who offer the He of Life and the Lotus of Resurrection, of the Aztec Tiamikli who leads the fallen warriors to the House of the Sun, of the well-shaped, strong, and tall-formed maidens who make the soul of the righteous go above the kind bridge and who place it in the presence of the heavenly gods themselves, of Arvisura on it, strong and holy, who proceeds from the God of Light, and of whom one asks for the glory which belongs to the Aryan race and to the holy Zarathustra, as well as wisdom and victory, of the Bride of Gezer, the Tibetan hero, who is an emanation of the conquering Dalma, not without relation to the double meaning of the Sanskrit term Sakti, which means both bride and power, to the Fravji, divine women who, like the Valkyrie, are simultaneously transcendental parts of the human soul and beings who bestow victory on those who invoke them, favors on those who love them, health on those who are all. This theme helps us to penetrate the esoteric dimension of some of the chivalrous literature about the woman and her cult. 
In the indo aryan tradition it is said, Verily, not for love of Skatra in a material sense is Skatra her dear, but for love of the soul the principle of the self which is light and immortality Skatra is dear. Satra Hood has deserted him who knows Karhod in anything else but the soul. The same idea may constitute the background of the particular aspect of chivalry that I have considered in this context. It is important to note that in some cases the symbolism of the woman may assume a negative, gincocratic character, see chapter 27, that is different from the character related to the core of chivalry that leads to the ideal of spiritual virility mentioned in the previous chapter. The persistent, repeated use of feminine characters, which is typical of cycles of a heroic type, in reality means nothing else but this, even when confronting the power that may enlighten him and led him to something more than human. The only ideal of the hero and of the knight is that active and affirmative attitude that in every normal civilization characterizes a true man as opposed to a woman. This is the mystery that in a more or less hidden form has shaped a part of the chivalrous medieval literature and that was familiar to the so-called courts of love since it was able to confer a deeper meaning to the often debated question whether a woman ought to prefer a cleric or a knight. Even the odd declarations of some chivalrous codes, according to which a knight, who is believed to have a semi-priestly dignity or to be a heavenly knight, has the right to make other people's women his own, including the women of his own sovereign, as long as he proves to be the strongest, and according to which the possession of a woman automatically derives from his victory, must be related to the meanings that I have discussed in the context of expounding the saga of the king of the woods of Nema, described in chapter 1. We are entering here into an order of real experiences and thus we must renounce the idea that these are just inoperative and abstract symbols. I must refer my readers to another work of mine, The Metaphysics of Sex, where I said that the initiatory woman or secret woman could be evoked in a real woman. In this book I also explained that eros, love, and sex were known and employed according to their real transcendent possibilities. Such possibilities were hinted at by several traditional teachings, so much so as to define a special path leading to the effective removal of the limitations of the empirical self into the participation in higher forms of being. Existentially, the nature of the warrior was such as to present eventually a qualification for this path. I cannot, however, develop this point any further in this context. Materialized and scattered fragments of an ancient symbolism are also found in other cases, such as the fact that the title of knight confers a special prestige and that the knight is in some cases so close to his horse that he shares both danger and glory with it and may become writ demoted from his rank when he allows himself to be unsaddled. These facts may let us beyond the merely material dimension and may be related to other affiliations of the ancient symbolism of the horse. The horse appears in the famous myths of Perseus and Bellerophon as a winged creature capable of taking to the sky, the riding of which constitutes a test for divine heroes. The symbolism becomes more evident in the Platonic myth where the outcome of the choice between the white and the black horse determines the transcendental destiny of the soul, represented by the charioteer, and also in the myth of Fay, Thin, who was flung into the river Eridanus by his horse driving force as it drove the sun chariot through the sky. In its traditional association with Poseidon, the god of the fluid element, the horse played the role of a symbol of the elementary life force. Even in its relation with Mars, another equestrian god of classical antiquity, the horse was the expression of the same force, which in ancient Rome was subjected to the warrior principle. The meaning of two representations, which in this context have a particular importance, will now become clear. First, in some classical figurations the hero-like soul that was transfigured or made was presented as a knight or accompanied by a horse. The second figuration is the so-called Kalkiyavar, according to the Indo-Aryan tradition. The force that will put an end to the dark era, Kali Yuga, will be embodied in the form of a white horse. It will destroy the evil people, and particularly the Malayaj, who are warriors demoted in rank and disjoined from the sacred. The coming of the Kalkiyavar to punish these people inaugurates the restoration of primordial spirituality. In another occasion, it would be interesting to follow the threads of these symbolic motifs from the Roman world all the way to the Middle Ages. On a more relative and historical plane, European aristocratic chivalry enjoyed a formal institution through the rite of ordination as it was defined around the 12th century. Following to seven-year periods in the service of a prince, from ages 7 to 14, and then from 14 to 21, in which the youth was supposed to prove his loyalty, faithfulness, and bravery, the rite of ordination took place at a date that coincided with Easter or Pentecost, thus suggesting the idea of a resurrection or of a descent of the spirit. First came a period of fasting and penance, followed by a symbolic purification through a bath, so that, according to Reddy, 
These nights may lead a new life and follow new habits. Secondly, at times, this came first, came the wakened arms. The person to be initiated spent the night in the church and prayed standing up or on his knees. Sitting was strictly prohibited, so that God may help him achieve what was lacking in his preparation. Following the example of the Nephites of the ancient mysteries, after the ritual bathing, the knight took on a white robe as a symbol of his renewed and purified nature. Sometimes he even wore a black vest, reminding him of the dissolution of mortal nature, and a red garment, which alluded to the deeds he was supposed to undertake at the cost of shedding his blood. Third came the priestly consecration of the arms that were laid on the altar and that concluded the rite by inducing a special spiritual influence that was supposed to sustain the new life of the warrior, who was now elevated to knightly dignity and turned into a member of the universal order represented by knighthood. In the Middle Ages we witness a blossoming of treatises in which every weapon of the knight was portrayed as a symbol of spiritual or ethical virtues. Symbols that were almost intended to remind him of these virtues in a visible way and to connect any chivalrous deed with an inner action. It would be easy to indicate the counterpart of this in the mysticism of weapons found in other traditional civilizations. I will limit myself to the example of the Japanese warrior aristocracy, which considered the sword katana as a sacred object. In Japan, the making of a sword followed precise, unbreakable rules. When a blacksmith fabricated a sword, he had to wear ceremonial robes and to purify the forge. The technique for ensuring the sharpness of a blade was kept absolutely secret, and it was transmitted only from master disciple. The blade of a sword was the symbol of the soul of the samurai and the use of such a weapon was subject to precise rules, likewise to train in its use and in the use of other weapons, such as the bow, because of their relation with Zen, could plunge a person into an initiatory dimension. In the list of knightly virtues given by Reddy, first came wisdom followed by faithfulness, liberality, and strength. According to a legend, Roland was an expert in theological science. He was portrayed engaging in a theological discussion with his enemy Fergus before combat. Godfrey of Billen was called by some of his contemporaries Lux Monarchum. Hugh of Tiberius, in his Ordine de Chevrolet, portrayed the knight as an armed priest, who, by virtue of his dignities, military and priestly, has the right to enter a church and to keep the order in it with his sacred sword. In the Indo-Aryan tradition, we see members of the warrior aristocracy competing victoriously in wisdom with the Brahmanid, that is, with the representatives of the priestly caste, for example, Ida Shutta verse Ida Shutta Balaika, Pahihel of verse Runi, Saktamar verse Narda, etc., becoming Brahmana, or, just like other Brahmana, being those who tend to the sacred flame. This confirms the inner character of chivalry and, in a wider sense, of the warrior caste in the world of tradition. With the decline of chivalry, the European nobility also eventually lost the spiritual element as a reference point for its highest faithfulness, and thus became part of merely political organisms, as in the case of the aristocracies of the national states that emerged after the collapse of the civilization of the Middle Ages. The principles of honor and of faithfulness continued to exist even when the noble was nothing but a king's officer. But faithfulness is blind when it does not refer, even in a mediated way, to something beyond the human dimension. Thus the qualities that were preserved in the European nobility through heredity eventually underwent a fatal degeneration when they were no longer renewed in their original spirit. The decline of the regal spirituality was unavoidably followed by the decline of nobility itself, and by the advent of the forces found in a lower order. I have mentioned that chivalry, both in its spirit and in its ethics, is an organic part of the empire, not of the church. It is true that the knight almost always included in his vows the defense of the faith. This should be taken as the generic sign of a militant commitment to something super-individual, rather than a conscious profession of faith in a specific and theological sense. Just by scraping a little bit off the surface, it becomes evident that the strongest trunks of the sprouting of knighthood derived there sap from orders and movements that had the odor of heresy to the church, to the point of being persecuted by her. Even from a traditional point of view, the doctrines of the Albigenses cannot be considered to be perfectly orthodox. However, we cannot fail to notice, especially in reference to Frederick II and to the Aragonese, a certain connection between the Albigenses and a current of chivalry that defended the imperial ideal against the Roman courier, and which during the Crusades ventured all the way to Jerusalem, not without a reason, which it conceived almost as the center of a higher spirituality than that which was in Cana and Papal Rome. The most characteristic case is that of the Knights Templar, ascetic warriors who gave up the pleasures of the world in order to pursue a discipline not practiced in the monasteries but on the battlefields, and who were animated by a faith consecrated more by blood and victory than by prayer.
The Templars had their own secret initiation, the details of which, though they were portrayed by their accusers with blasphemous tint, are very significant. Among other things, in a preliminary part of the ritual the candidates to the highest degree of Templar initiation were supposed to reject the symbol of the cross and to acknowledge that Christ's doctrine did not lead to salvation. The Templars were also accused of engaging in secret dealings with the infidels and of celebrating wicked rites. These were just symbols, as it was declared repeatedly, though in vain, at the Templars' trial. In all probability, this was not a case of sacrilegious impiety of acknowledgment of the inferior character of the exoteric tradition represented by devotional Christianity, an acknowledgment that was required in order for one to be elevated to higher forms of spirituality. Generally speaking, as somebody has correctly remarked, the very name Templars bespeaks transcendence. Temple is a more august, comprehensive, and inclusive term than church. The temple dominates the church. Churches fall in ruins, but the temple stands as a symbol of the kinship of religions and of the perennial spirit informing them. The grill is another characteristic reference point of chivalry. The saga of the grail closely reflects the hidden ambition of the Ghibelin knights. This saga too has hidden motifs that cannot be ascribed to the church or to Christianity alone. Not only does the official Catholic tradition not acknowledge the grail, but the essential elements of the saga are related to pre-Christian and even Nordic hyperbury. Traditions. In this context, I can only remind the reader that in the most important versions of the legend, the grail is portrayed as a stone, a stone of light and Luciferian stone, rather than as a mystical chalice, that the adventures related to the grail, almost without exception, have a more heroic and initiatory rather than a Christian and Eucharistic character, that Wolfram von Eschenmach refers to the Knights of the Grail as Templice, and finally that the Templar insignia, a red cross on a white background, is found on the garment of some of the Grail Knights and on the sail of the ship on which Pozo, Arsifal, leaves never to return. It is worth noting that even in the most Christianized versions of the saga one still finds extra ecclesial references. It is said that the Grail is a bright chalice, the presence of which produces a magical animation, a foreboding, and an anticipation of a non-human life following the Last Supper and Jesus' death, was taken by angels into heaven from where it is not supposed to return until the emergence on earth of a stock of heroes capable of safeguarding. The leader of this stock instituted an order of perfector, heavenly knights dedicated to this purpose. The myth and the highest ideal of medieval chivalry was to reach the grail in its new earthly abode and to belong to such an order, which was often identified with King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. Considering that the Catholic Church has descended directly and without any interruptions from primitive Christianity, and considering the fact that the Christianized Grail disappeared until that time a knightly rather than priestly order was to be instituted, this obviously testifies to the emergence of a different tradition than the Catholic and Apostolic one. There is more, in almost all the texts dealing with the Grail. The symbol of the temple, still a very priestly one, is abandoned in favor of the symbol of the quarter of a regal castle as the mysterious, inaccessible, and well-protected place in which the Grail is kept. The central theme of the mystery of the Grail, besides the test of mending a broken sword, consists in a regal restoration. There is the expectation of a knight who will restore the prestige of a decadent realm and who will avenge or heal a king who is either wounded, paralyzed, or in a catatonic state. Crisscrossing references connect these themes both to the imperial myth and to the very idea of a supreme and invisible and polar center of the world. It is obvious that in this cycle, which was important to the medieval chivalrous world, a particular tradition was at work. This tradition had little to do with that of the dominant religion, and although it occasionally adopted some elements from Christianity, maybe it did so the better to express, or conversely, to hide itself. The grill is truly a myth of the regal religion that confirms what has been said about the secret soul of chivalry. When looking at the outer domain relative to a general view of life and of ethics, the overall scope of the formative and correcting action that Christianity underwent because of the world of chivalry must be acknowledged. Christianity could not reconcile itself with the ethos of chivalry and espouse the idea of a holy war other than by betraying the principles of that dualistic and exquisite spirituality that characterized it over and against the traditional and classical world. Christianity had to forget Augustine's words. Those who can think of war and endure it without experiencing great sufferings have truly lost their sense of humanity. The more radical expressions of Tertullian in his warning, the Lord, by ordering Peter to put the sword back into the scabbard, has thereby disarmed soldiers. The martyrdom of Saints Maximilian and Theogen, who preferred to die rather than to serve in the army, and St. Martin's words prior to battle, I am a soldier of Christ. I am not allowed to draw the sword. 
Christianity also had to bestow on the chivalrous principle of honor a very different understanding than what the Christian principle of love could allow for. Moreover, it had to conform to a type of morality that was more heroic and pagan than evangelical. It also had to close an eye to expressions such as John of Salisbury's, the military profession, both worthy and necessary, has been instituted by God himself. And it even had to come to see war as a possible ascetical and immortalizing path. Moreover, it was thanks to this very deviation of the church from the main themes of primitive Christianity that during the Middle Ages, Europe came to know the last image of a world that in many aspects was of a traditional type. Chapter 14. The Doctrine of the Caste the caste system is one of the main expressions of the traditional socio-political order, a form victorious over chaos, and the embodiment of the metaphysical ideas of stability and justice. The division of individuals into caste or into equivalent groups according to their nature and to the different rank of activities they exercise with regard to pure spirituality is found with the same traits in all higher forms of traditional civilizations, and it constitutes the essence of the primordial legislation and of the social order according to justice. Conformity to one's caste was considered by traditional humanity as the first and main duty of an individual. The most complete type of caste hierarchy, the ancient Indo-Aryan system, was visibly inspired by the hierarchy of the various functions found in a physical organism animated by the spirit. At the lower level of such an organism there are the undifferentiated and impersonal energies of matter and of mere vitality. The regulating action of the functions of the metabolism and of the organism is exercised upon these forces. These functions, in turn, are regulated by the will, which moves and directs the body as an organic whole in space and time. Finally, we assume the soul to be the center, the sovereign power, and the light of the entire organism. The same is true for the caste. The activities of the slaves or workers, shubras, were subordinated to the activities of the bourgeoisie. As if, higher up in the hierarchy, we find the warrior nobility, kshatriya, and finally the representatives of the spiritual authority and power, the brahmana, in the original sense of the word, and the leaders as pontifices. These groups were arranged in a hierarchy that corresponded to the hierarchy of the functions within a living organism. Such was the Indo-Aryan socio-political system, which closely resembled the Persian system. The latter was articulated into the four pishtra of the lords of fire, half riva, of the warriors, Rathisa, of the heads of the family, Vaisriashunt, and of the serfs assigned to manual labor, Hoda. An analogous pattern was found in other civilizations up to the European Middle Ages, which followed the division of people into servants, purgas, nobility, and clergy. In the Platonic worldview, the caste corresponded to different powers of the soul and to particular virtues. The rulers, the warriors, and the workers corresponded respectively to the spirit, nose, and to the head, to the animus, and to the chest, and to the faculty of desire and to the lower organs of the body regulating sex and the functions of excretion. In this way, as stated by Plato, the external order and hierarchy correspond to an inner order and hierarchy according to justice. The idea of organic correspondence is also found in the well-known Vedic simile of the generation of the various castes from the distinct parts of the primordial man or Purusha. The castes, more than defining social groups, defined functions and typical ways of being and acting. The correspondence of the fundamental natural possibilities of the single individual to any of these functions determined his or her belonging to the corresponding caste. Thus, in the duties toward one's caste, each caste was traditionally required to perform specific duties. The individual was able to recognize the normal explication as well as the development and the chrism of his or her own nature within the overall order imposed from above. This is why the caste system developed and was applied in the traditional world as a natural, agreeable institution based on something that everybody regarded as obvious, rather than on violence, oppression, or on what in modern terms is referred to as social injustice. By acknowledging his own nature, traditional man knew his own place, function, and what would be the correct relationship with both superiors and in fee. Hence, if Aveza did not acknowledge the authority of Akshatriya, or if Akshatriya did not uphold his superiority in regards to Aveza or Achutar, this was not so much considered a fault but as the result of ignorance. A hierarchy was not a device of the human will but a law of nature and as impersonal a physical law is that according to which a lighter fluid floats on top of a denser fluid, unless an upsetting factor intervenes. There was a firmly upheld principle according to which those who want to institute a process at variance with human nature cannot make it function as an ethical system. What upsets modern sensitivity the most about the caste system is the law of heredity and preclusion. 
It seems unfair that fate may seal up earth one social status and predetermine the type of activity to which a man will consecrate the rest of his life and which he will not be able to abandon, not even in order to pursue an inferior one, lest he become an outcast, a pariah shunned by everybody. When seen against the background of the traditional view of life, however, these difficulties are overcome. The closed caste system was based on two fundamental principles. The first principle consisted of the fact that traditional man considered everything visible and worldly as the mere effects of causes of a higher order. Thus, for example, to be born according to this or that condition, as a man or a woman, in one caste rather than in another, in one race instead of another, and to be endowed with specific talents and dispositions, was not regarded as pure chance. All of these circumstances were explained by traditional man as corresponding to the nature of the principle embodied in an empirical self, were the world already present transcendently in the act of undertaking human birth, such as one of the aspects of the Hindu doctrine of karma. Although this doctrine does not correspond to what is commonly meant by reincarnation, it still implies the generic idea of the pre-existence of causes and the principle that human beings are heirs of karma. Similar doctrines were not typical of the East alone. According to a Hellenistic teaching, not only the soul's quality exists before any bodily life, it has exactly what it chose to have, but the body has been organized and determined by the image of the soul which is in it. Also, according to some Persian Aryan views that eventually found their way to Greece and then to ancient Rome, the doctrine of sacred regality was connected to the view that souls are attracted by certain affinities to a given planet corresponding to the predominant qualities and to the rank of human birth, the king was considered Damus Natus precisely because he was believed to have followed the path of solar influences. Those who love philosophical explanations should remember that Kant's and Schopenhauer's theory concerning the intelligible character, the pneuma character that perceives the phenomenal world, relates to a similar order of ideas. And so, even these premises in excluding the idea that birth is a casual event, the doctrine of the caste appears under a very different light. It can be said, therefore, that birth does not determine nature, but that nature determines birth. More specifically, a person is endowed with a certain spirit by virtue of being born in a given caste. But at the same time, one is born in a specific caste because one possesses, transcendently, a given spirit. Hence, the differences between the caste, far from being artificial, unfair, and arbitrary, were just the reflection and the confirmation of a pre-existing, deeper and more intimate inequality, they represented a higher application of the principle sum cuque. In the context of a living tradition, the caste represented the natural place of the earthly convergence of analogous wills and vocations. Also, the regular and closed hereditary transmission forged a homogeneous group sharing favorable organic, vitalistic, and even psychic proclivities in view of the regular development on the part of single individuals of the aforesaid prenatal determinations or dispositions on the plane of human existence. The individual did not receive from the caste his own nature. Rather, the caste afforded him the opportunity to recognize or remember his own nature and prenatal will, while at the same time presenting him with a kind of occult heritage related to the blood so that he would be able to realize the latter in a harmonious way. The characteristics, the functions, and the duties of the caste constituted the traces for the regular development of one's possibilities in the context of an organic social system. In the higher caste, initiation completed this process by awakening and inducing in the single individual certain influences that were already oriented in a supernatural direction. Those of the single individual, namely, those prerogatives and distinct rights inherent to each of these traditional articulations, not only allowed this transcendental will to be in harmony with the congenial human heredity, but also allowed everybody to find in the social organism a condition that really corresponded to their own nature and to their deepest attitudes. Such a condition was protected against any confusion and prevarication. When the sense of personality is not focused on the ephemeral principle of human individuality, which is destined to leave behind nothing but shadow at death, all this seems very natural and evident. It is true that much can be achieved in a lifetime, but achievements mean absolutely nothing from a higher point of view, from a point of view that knows that the progress of decay of the organism will eventually push one into nothingness, when they do not actualize the pre-existing will that is the reason for a specific birth. Such a prenatal will cannot be easily altered by a temporary and arbitrary decision taken at a given point of one's earthly journey. Once this is understood, the necessity of the castes will become clear. The only self a modern man knows and is willing to acknowledge is the empirical self that begins at birth and is more or less extinguished at death.
Everything is reduced by him to the mere human individual since in him all prior recollections have disappeared. Thus we witness the disappearance of both the possibility of establishing contact with those forces of which a given birth is just the effect, and the possibility of rejoining that non-human element in man, which being situated before birth, is also beyond death. This element constitutes the place for everything that may eventually be realized beyond death itself and is the principle of an incomparable sense of security. Once the rhythm has been broken, the contacts lost, and the great distances precluded to the human eye, all the paths seem open and every field is saturated with disorderly, inorganic activities that lack a deep foundation in meaning and are dominated by temporal and particularistic motivations and by passions, cheap interest, and vanity. In this context, culture is no longer the context in which it is possible to actualize one's being through serious commitment and faithfulness. It is rather the locus for self-actualization. And since the shifting sands of that nothing is without a name and tradition that is the empirical human subject have become the foundation of that self-actualization, the claim to equality and the right to be, as a matter of principle, anything one chooses to be is therefore carried forward as strenuously advocated in modern society. No other difference is acknowledged to be more right and true than that which is achieved through one's efforts and merit according to the terms of various vain, intellectual, moral, or social beliefs typical of these recent times. In the same way, it is only natural that the only things left are the limits of the most coarse physical heredity, which have become the signs of incomprehensible meanings and which are endeared or enjoyed according to Ekis, as a caprice of fate. It is also natural of that personality and blood traits, social vocation and function are all elements that have become increasingly discordant to the point of generating states of real, tragic, inner and outer conflict. From a legal and ethical perspective, they have also led to a qualitative destruction, to a relative leveling, to equal rights and duties, and to an equal social morality that pretends to be imposed on everyone and to be valid for all people in the same way, with total disregard for single natures and for different inner dignities. The overcoming of the caste and of the traditional socio-political orders has no other meaning. The individual has achieved all his freedom. His chain is not short, and his intoxication and his illusions as a restless puppet have no limits. The freedom enjoyed by the man of tradition was something very different. It did not consist in discarding but in being able to rejoin the deeper vein of his will, which was related to the mystery of his own existential form. In reality, that which corresponds to birth and to the physical element of a being reflects what can be called, in a mathematical sense, the resultant the vectoral of some of the various forces or tendencies at work in his birth. In other words, it reflects the direction of the stronger force. In this force, there may be inclinations of minor intensity that have been swept away and that correspond to talents and tendencies that on the plane of individual consciousness are distinct from both their own organic performation and the duties and environment of one's caste. These instances of inner contradiction within a traditional political order regulated by the caste system must be considered an exception to the rule. They become predominant, though, in a society that no longer knows the castes and, in general, in distinct social organisms in which there is no law to gather, preserve, and shape talents and qualifications in view of specific functions. Here we encounter a chaos of existential and psychic possibilities that condemns most people to a state of disharmony and social tension. We can see plenty of that nowadays. Undoubtedly, there may have been a margin of indetermination even in the case of traditional man. But this margin in him only served to emphasize the positive aspect of these two sayings, know yourself, complemented by the saying, nothing superfluous, and be yourself, which implied an action of inner transformation and organization leading to the elimination of this margin of indetermination and to the integration of the self. To discover the dominating trait of one's form and cast into will it, by transforming it into an ethical imperative and, moreover, to actualize it, rip through faithfulness in order to destroy everything that ties one to the earth, instincts, hedonistic motivations, material considerations, and so on. Such is the complement of the above-mentioned view that leads to the second foundation of the caste system in its closeness and stability. On the other hand, we must keep in mind that aspect of the traditional spirit according to which there was no object or function that in itself could be considered as superior or inferior to another. The true difference was rather given by the way in which the object or the function was lived out. The earthly way, inspired by utilitaire or by greed, sakaim karma, was contrasted with the heavenly way of the one who acts without concern for the consequences and for the sake of the action itself, nishkama karma, and who transforms every action into a right and into an offering. 
Such was the path of bhakti, a term that in this context corresponds more to the virile sense of medieval fides than to the pietistic sense that has prevailed in the theistic idea of devotion. An action performed according to this type of bhakti was compared to a fire that generates light and in which the matter of the act itself is consumed and purified. The degree to which the act was freed from matter, detached from greed and passion, and made self-sufficient a pure act, to employ analogically an Aristotelian expression, defined the hierarchy of activities and consequently the hierarchy of the castes or other bodies that corresponded to them as functional classes. Given these premises, which were not theoretical but experiential and thus at times not even openly expressed, the aspiration to go from one kind of activity to another, and therefore from one caste to another, which from a superficial and utilitarian perspective may be considered by some as a worthier and more advantageous step, was hardly considered in the traditional world, so much so that the heredity of functions was spontaneously established even where there were no castes, but only social groups. Every type of function and activity appeared equally as a point of departure for an elevation in a different and vertical rather than horizontal sense, and not in the temporal, but in the spiritual order. In this regard, by being in their own caste, in faithfulness to their own caste and to their own nature, in obedience not to a general morality but to their morality, or to the morality of their own caste, everyone enjoyed the same dignity and the same purity as everybody else. This was true for a shudra as well as for a king. Everybody performed their function within the overall social order, and through their own peculiar bhakti even product of the supernatural principle of the same order. Thus it was said, a man attains perfection when his work is worship of God, from whom all things come and who is in all. The god Krishna declared, In any way that men love me, in the same way they find my love. For many are the paths of men, but they all in the end come to me. And also, in the liberty from the bonds of attachment, do thou therefore the work to be done. For the man whose work is pure attains indeed the supreme. The notion of dharma, or one's peculiar nature to which one is supposed to be faithful, comes from the root doctor to sustain, to uphold, and it expresses the element of order, form, or cosmos that tradition embodies and implements over and against chaos and becoming. Through dharma the traditional world, just like every living thing and every being, is upheld, the dams holding back the sea of pure contingency and temporality stand firm, living beings partake of stability. It is therefore clear why leaving one's caste and mixing castes are even the rights, the duties, the morality, and the cults of each caste was considered a sacrilege that destroys the efficacy of every right and leads those who are guilty of it to hell, that is, to the realm of demonic influences that belong to the inferior nature. The people guilty of crossing the caste line were considered the only, impure beings in the entire hierarchy. They were pariahs, or, untouchables because they represented centers of psych infection in the sense of an inner dissolution. In India only the people, without a caste, were considered outcasts, and they were shunned even by the lowest caste, even if they had previously belonged to the highest caste. On the contrary, nobody felt humiliated by his own caste, and even a shooter was as proud of and as committed to his own caste as a Brahmin of the highest station was to his. Generally speaking, the idea of contamination did not concern only the individual of a higher caste who mix with a member of a lower caste. Even the latter felt contaminated by such mixture. When gold and leader mix together, they are both altered. They both lose their own nature. Therefore, it was necessary for everybody to be themselves. Thus, mixing subverted the traditional order and opened the door to infernal forces by removing what Goethe called the creative limitation. The goal of the transfiguration of the form, which was obtained through a bhakti and nishkama karma, namely, the reaction is right and as a bled. The alteration, the destruction of the form, no matter the way it was carried out, was considered as a degrading form of escapism. The outcast was just the vanquished. In the Aryan East, he was called a fallen one, Padius. This was the second principle on which the caste system was founded. It was a thoroughly spiritual foundation, since India which implemented this system in one of its strictest versions, even to the point of becoming sclerotic, never had a centralized organization that could impose it by means of a political or economic despotism. Moreover, it is possible to find expressions of this second foundation even in the Western forms of tradition. It was a classical idea, for instance, that perfection cannot be measured with a material criterion, but that it rather consists in realizing one's nature in a thorough way.
The ancients also believed that materiality only represents the inability to actualize one's form, since matter was depicted in Plato and Aristotle's writings as the foundation of undifferentiation and of an evasive instability that causes a thing or being to be incomplete in itself and not to correspond to its Norman idea, that is, to its dharma. In the Roman deification of the limit, termin or terminus, implemented through the elevation of the god terminus to the highest dignity, he was even associated with the Olympian god Jupiter, as a principle of order and also as the patron saint of the limits, in the tradition, susceptible of being interpreted in terms of higher meanings, according to which he who knocked down or removed a single one of the territorial boundary stones was an accursed being to be killed on sight by anybody. And in the Roman oracle that announced that the ear of the destruction of the limits erected against human greed will also be the cyclum of the end of the world, in all these elements we find the esoteric reverberation of the same spirit. Plotinus wrote, Each several thing must be a separate thing. There must be acts and thoughts that are our own. The good and evil done by each human being must be his own. The idea that to comply perfectly with one's own specific function leads to an identical participation in the spirituality of the whole, conceived as a living organism, can be traced back to the best Greco-Roman traditions. Later on it eventually became part of the organic vision of the Germanic-Roman civilization of the Middle Ages. The presuppositions for the sense of joy and pride in one's own profession, such that any job, no matter how humble it was, could be performed as an art, which have been preserved in some European peoples until recent times as an echo of the traditional spirit, are not any different, after all. The ancient German peasant, for instance, experienced his cultivating the land as a title of nobility, even though he was not able to see in this work, unlike his Persian counterpart, a symbol in an episode of the struggle between the god of light and the god of darkness. The members of the medieval corporations and guilds were as proud of their professional tradition as the nobility was proud of its bloodline. And when Luther, following St. Thomas, taught that to go from one profession to another in order to enhance one's position in the social hierarchy ranked contrary to God's law because God assigns to each and every one his or her own state, and therefore people must obey him by remaining where they are and that the only way to serve God consists in doing one's best at one's job. The tradition was faithfully preserved in these ideas, and the best spirit of the Middle Ages was reflected, although with the limitations inherent in a theistic and devotional schema. Prior to the advent of the civilization of the Third Estate, mercantilism, capitalism, the social ethics that was religiously sanctioned in the West consisted in realizing one's being and in achieving one's own perfection within the fixed parameters that one's individual nature and the group to which one belonged clearly defined. Economic activity, work, and profit were justified only in the measure in which they were necessary for sustenance and to ensure the dignity of an existence conformed to one's own estate, without the lower instinct of self-interest or profit coming first. Hence, we encounter a character of active impersonality in this domain as well. It has been noted that in the caste hierarchy, relationships like those occurring between potentiality and act were reenacted. In the superior caste, the same activity that in the inferior caste presented itself in a more conditioned form was manifested in a more pure, complete, and freer manner as an idea. This allows us to take issue with the modern demagogical ideas concerning an alleged folk-like mindedness of individuals who lived in traditional societies, and concerning the alleged lack of that sense of dignity and freedom of every individual that only modern, evolved mankind is supposed to have achieved. In fact, even when the hierarchical position of the individual did not proceed from the spontaneous acknowledgement of one's own nature and one's faithfulness to it, the subordination of the inferior to the superior, far from being indolent acquiescence, was almost a symbolic and ritual expression of a faithfulness and a devotion to one's particular ideal and to a higher form of being that the inferior could not directly and organically live out as his own nature, Sveidhamen but which he could still consider as the center of his own actions precisely through his devotion and active subordination to a higher caste. Moreover, although in the East to leave one's caste was only allowed in exceptional cases and a fugitive was far from being considered a free man, it was still possible to create certain causes through the way one conducted oneself in thought, word, and deed. These causes, by virtue of the analogy with the principle or with the hierarchy to which one was subjected, could produce a new way of being that corresponded to that principle or to that hierarchy.
Besides the bhakti or finds that is aimed directly at the supreme principle, that is, at the unconditioned, the bhakti that was centered on some other high principle was thought to have the real and objective power to resolve the elements of the one who had nursed it, following the fulfillment of his own dharma, into the same principle, and thus to make that person ascend, not exteriorly and artificially, as is the case in the disorder and careerism of modern society, but from within, in a profound and organic way, from a lower to a higher degree of the spiritual hierarchy is a reflection of the passage of the transcendental principle of being from one possibility to another. Regarding that kind of social order that had its center in a sovereign and lasted up to the time of the Holy Roman Empire, there survives the principle upheld by Celsus against the dualism of early Christianity, according to which the subjects may demonstrate their faithfulness to God through faithfulness to the ruler. The view of the subject as a being connected to the person of his sovereign through a sacred and freely chosen vow is an ancient Indo-European view. In the traditional world, this fides or personal devotion went beyond political and individual boundaries and even acquired the value of a path leading to liberation. Kant, in reference to Iran, observed that the subjects dedicated to their deified kings not only their actions and words, but their very thoughts. Their duty was a complete abandonment of their personality in favor of those monarchs who were held the equal of gods. The sacred militia of the mysteries was nothing but the civic morality viewed from the religious standpoint. It confounded loyalty with piety. This loyalty, in the brightest and most luminous forms of tradition, was credited with the power of producing the same fruits faith is supposed to produce. Not so many years ago, the Japanese General Nobi, who had prevailed at Port Arthur against his Russian foes, killed himself with his wife after the death of his emperor in order to follow him in the afterlife. All of this is self-evident since I have said that faithfulness is the second cornerstone of every traditional organization, in addition to the right and an elite that embodies transcendence. This is the force that, as a magnet, establishes contacts, creates a psychic atmosphere, stabilizes the social structure, and determines a system of coordination and gravitation between the individual elements in the center. When this fluid, which is rooted in freedom and in the spiritual spontaneity of the personality, fails, the traditional organism loses its elementary power of cohesion, paths become precluded, subtler senses atrophied, the parts dissociated inanimate. The consequence of this degeneration is the immediate withdrawal of the forces from above, which thus abandon men to themselves, leaving them free to go where they wish according to the destiny that their actions create and that no superior influence will ever be able to modify again. This is the mystery inherent in decadence. Chapter 15. Professional Associations and the Arts, Slavery When viewed as a relation between potentiality and act, hierarchy allowed the same motif established at the top to be reproduced in the activities of the different castes or social organisms, though on the plane of different, more or less spiritual, paths of fulfillment, each one retained in its own way the same upward orientation. This is why in the more complete traditional forms, the sacred was a light that shone not only on what today are the profane sciences, arts, and professions, but on trades and various material activities as well. By virtue of the analogical correspondences existing between the various planes, the sciences, activities, and skills of the lower plane could traditionally be considered as symbols of a higher nature and thus help to communicate the meaning hidden in the latter, since it was already present in the former, even though in a potential form. In the domain of knowledge, the presupposition was of a system of sciences fundamentally different in their premises and methodologies from modern ones. Every modern, profane science corresponds in the world of tradition to a sacred science that had an organic, qualitative character and considered nature as a whole in a hierarchy of degrees of reality and forms of experience in which the form connected to the physical senses is just one among others. It is precisely in this way that the system of transpositions and symbolic and ritual participations was made possible. This was the case in cosmology and in related disciplines. For instance, ancient alchemy was not at all a primitive chemistry and ancient astrology was not at all, as it is mistakenly assumed today, a superstitious deification of the heavenly bodies and of their movements. But a knowledge of the stars so organized as to be able to constitute a science of purely spiritual and metaphysical realities expressed in a symbolic form. The world of tradition knew in these same terms of physiology, parts of which are still preserved in the East, for example, the knowledge of anatomy and physiology presupposed by Chinese acupuncture, Japanese jujitsu, and some aspects of Hindu Hatha Yua, 
In this physiology, the consideration of the material aspect of the human organism represented only a particular chapter, becoming part of the general science of the correspondences between macrocosm and microcosm, human world and elemental world. Ancient medicine proceeded from these same premises as a sacred science in which health appeared as a symbol of virtue, for virtue in turn was considered a superior form of health and due to the ambiguity of the term soter, he who saves was on a higher plane of the same type as he who heals. The development of the physical and practical aspect of knowledge in these traditional sciences must naturally appear as limited when compared and contrasted with modern sciences. The cause of this, however, was a correct and healthy hierarchy in which the interests of traditional man were arranged. In other words, he did not give to the knowledge of external and physical reality more importance than it deserved or than was necessary. What mattered the most in a traditional science was the enomagic element, namely, the power to lead to higher planes that was virtually present in the knowledge relative to a given domain of reality. This element is totally lacking today in modern profane sciences. The latter, in reality, may act and have acted exactly in the opposite direction. The worldview from which they originate and on which they are based is such as to affect human interiority in a dissolving and negative way. In other words, they are centrifugal. Coming back to our subject matter, analogous considerations to the previous ones may be extended to the domain of the arts, understood both as real arts and as the activities of professional artisans. Concerning the former, only in periods of decadence did the world of tradition come to know the emancipation of the purely aesthetic, subjective, and human element that characterizes modern arts. In the figurative arts, even prehistoric findings, such as the civilization of the Cro-Magnon and of the reindeer, show the inseparability of the naturalistic element from a magical and symbolic intention. An analogous dimension was present also in later, more developed civilizations. The theater corresponded to reenactments of the mysteries, to the sacred dramas and, in part, to the load of a classical antiquity, more in which later, ancient poetry had close ties with the art of telling the future and with sacred inspiration. Poetic verse, in fact, was associated with incantation, see the ancient meaning of the word Carmen. As far as literature is concerned, the symbolic and initiatory element, which proceeded from a conscious intention and also from infraconscious influences grafted onto the creative spontaneity of single individuals and of various groups, throughout the Middle Ages often influenced not only the myth, saga, and traditional fairy tale, but the epic stories in chivalrous and erotic literature as well. The same applies to music, dance, and rhythm. Lucian reports that dancers who were assimilated to priests, had a knowledge of the sacred mysteries of the Egyptians, as the science of the mutters, the symbolic, magical gestures that play an important role in Hindu rituals and ascetical paths affected the dance, the mime and pantomime of that civilization. Again, these were various expressions of the same one intent, one temple, sculptured in a forest of temples. With specific regard to professional and artisanal activities, a typical example is given in the art of construction and building. Their moral transpositions in the Gospels are well known, which occasioned even higher and initiatory interpretations. In the ancient Egyptian tradition, construction was regarded as a regal art, so much so that the king himself performed in a symbolic sense the first acts of the building of the temples in the spirit of an eternal work of art. While on the one hand people to dare nowadays puzzled when it comes to explaining how achievements that require a superior knowledge of mathematics and engineering are possible in antiquity. On the other hand, what emerges are unquestionable signs of a priestly art in the orientation, placement, and other aspects of ancient buildings, especially temples and, later on, cathedrals. The symbolism of masonry established illogical connections between the little art on the one hand and the great art and the great work on the other within secret associations that in the beginning could claim links with the corresponding medieval professional corporations. This is also partially true in the case of the arts of the blacksmiths, weavers, navigators, and farmers. Concerning the latter, just as Egypt knew the ritual of regal constructions, likewise the Far East knew the ritual of regal plowing and, in a symbolic transposition of the farming art, generally speaking, man himself was considered as a field to be cultivated, and the initiate as the cultivate of the field in an eminent sense. The echo of this has been preserved in the very origins of the modern term culture in its reductive, intellectualistic, and petty bourgeois meaning.
The ancient arts, after all, were traditionally sacred to specific deities and heroes, always by virtue of analogical reasons, and thus they presented themselves as potentially endowed with the possibility of retransforming physical activities into symbolic actions endowed with a transcendent meaning. In reality, in the caste system, not only did every profession and trade correspond to a vocation, hence the double meaning preserved in the English term calling. Not only was there something to be found in every product as a crystallized tradition that could be activated by a free and personal activity and by an incomparable skill. Not only were the dispositions developed in the exercise of a trade and acknowledged by the social organism transmitted through the blood as congenital and deep attitudes, but something else was present as well, namely, the transmission, if not the real initiation, of at least an inner tradition of the art that was preserved as a sacred and secret thing. Archonomicasterum, even though it was partly visible in the several details and rules, which was symbolic and religious elements that were displayed in the traditional guilds, whether Eastern, Mexican, Roman, Medieval, and so on. Being introduced to the secrets of an art did not correspond to the mere empirical or rational teachings of modern man. In this domain certain cognitions were credited with a non-human origin, an idea expressed in a symbolic form by the traditions concerning the gods, the demons, or the heroes, Baldur, Hermes, Vulcan, Prometheus, who originally initiated men into these arts. It is significant that Janus, who was also the god of initiation, was the god of the Cologi Fibrom in Rome. In relation to this we find the idea that mysterious congregations of blacksmiths who came to Europe from the East also brought with them a new civilization. Moreover, it is significant that in the locations where the oldest temples of Hera, Copper, Aphrodite, Venus, Heracles, Hercules, and Danis were built, quite often it is possible to find archaeological evidence of the working of copper and bronze. And finally, it is significant that the Orphic and Dian Finc mysteries were associated with the themes of the art of weaving and spinning. This sort of found its most complete fulfillment in examples found especially in the East, where the achievement of an effective mastery in a given art was just a symbol or reflection, and a sign, in fact, it was the counterpart of a fulfillment and a parallel to realization. Even in those areas in which the caste system did not have the rigor and the determination exemplified by Aryan India, something resembling it was developed in a spontaneous way in relation to inferior activities. I am referring to the ancient corporations or artisan guilds that were omnipresent in the traditional world, and that in the case of ancient Rome date back to prehistoric times, reproducing on their own plane the typical makeup of the patrician gens and family. It is the art and the common activity that provide a bond in an order of placing those that in higher castes were provided by the aristocratic tradition of blood and ritual. This does not imply that the Collegum and the corporation lacked a religious character and a virile, semi-military constitution. In Sparta, the cult of a hero represented the ideal bond between the members of a given profession, even in the case of an inferior one. Just like every city in Gens, in Rome every corporation, originally consisting of free men, had its own demon or lar. It had a temple consecrated to it and a correlative, common cult of the dead, that determined a unity in life and in death. It had its own sacrificial rites performed by the magistrate on behalf of the community of the Sodales or Cologi. Who celebrated certain events or holy days in a solemn, mystical way through feasts, agates, and games. The fact that the anniversary of the Collegum or Corporation, Natalis Kalji, coincided with the anniversary of its patron deity, Natalis Day, and of the inauguration or consecration of the temple, Natalis Temple, indicates that in the eyes of the Sodales, the sacred element constituted the center from which the inner life of the corporation originated. The Roman corporation is a good example of the virile and organic aspect that often accompanies the sacred dimension in traditional institutions. It was hierarchically constituted at example in Republicae and animated by a military spirit. The body of Sodalus was called Popol Sorodo, and just like the army and the people at solemn gatherings, it was divided into Cantori and Decoria. Every Cantori had its leader, a centurion, and a lieutenant, just like in the legions. To differentiate them from the masters, the other members had the name of plebs incorporated, but also call a guide or a militus call a guide like simple soldiers, and the magister, besides being the master of the yard and the priest of the corporation in charge of his fire, was the administrator of justice and the overseer of the behavior of the members of the group. Analogous characteristics were found in the medieval professional communities, especially in Germanic countries. Together with the community of the art, a religious and ethical element bound the members of the guild and of the Zonfin. In these corporate organizations, the members were bonded together, for life more is in a common right than on the basis of the economic interest and mere productive goals. The effects of intimate solidarity, 
which affected man as a whole and not just his particular aspect as an artisan, permeated everyday life in all of its forms. As the Roman professional colleague I had their own Laura de men, the German guilds, which were constituted as small-scale images of cities, also had their own patron saint, altar, common funerary cults, symbolic insignia, ritual commemorations, ethical laws, and leaders, who were supposed to regulate the art and guarantee compliance with the general norms and duties regulating the lives of the members of the corporation. The requirement for being admitted to the guilds was a spotless name and an honorable birth. People who were not free and those belonging to foreign races were not admitted. Typical of these professional associations were the sense of honor, purity, and impersonal character of their work, almost according to the Aryan canons of Bhakti and of Nishkamakarna. Everybody performed their work silently, setting their own person aside, while still remaining active and free human beings. This was an aspect of the great anonymity typical of the Middle Ages and of every great traditional civilization. Something else was shunned, namely, anything that could generate illicit competition or monopoly, thus contaminating the purity of the art with mere economic concerns. The honor of one's guild and the pride in the activity characterizing it constituted the firm, immaterial bases of these organizations. While not formally hereditary, these organizations often became so, thereby demonstrating the strength and the nat of the principal responsible for generating the castes. In this way, even in the order of inferior activities connected to matter and to material conditions of life it was possible to find the reflection of the way of being of a purified and free action endowed with its own fides and living soul, which freed it from the bonds of selfishness and ordinary interest. In the corporations, there was a natural and organic connection between the caste of the Vesa, in modern terms, management, and the caste of the Shudras, namely, the working class. Considering the spirit of an almost military solidarity that was both felt and willed, and whereby the Vesa was the equivalent of a manager and the Shudra an employee, both of whom worked in the same company, the Marxist antithesis between capital and labor, between employers and employees, at that time would have been inconceivable. Everybody attended their own function and stayed in their own place. Especially in the German guilds, the faithfulness of the inferior was the counterpart of the pride the superior took in the subordinate zeal and officie. In this context, too, the anarchy of rights and demands did not arise until the inner spiritual orientation died out and the action performed in purity was supplanted by one motivated by materialistic and individualistic concerns, and by the multiform and vain fever brought about by the modern spirit and a civilization that has turned economics into a guiding principle, demon, and a destiny. When the inner strength of a fides is no longer present, then every activity is defined according to its purely material aspect. Also, equally worthy paths are replaced with an effect riven differentiation dictated by the type of activity being performed. Hence, the sense of intermediary forms of social organization, such as ancient slavery. As paradoxical as it may first appear in the context of those civilizations that largely employed the institution of slavery, it was work that characterized the condition of a slave, and not vice versa. In other words, when the activity in the lower strata of the social hierarchy was no longer supported by a spiritual meaning, and when instead of an action there was only work, then the material criterion was destined to take over and those activities related to matter and connected to the material needs of life were destined to appear as degrading and as unworthy of any free human being. Therefore, work, pawness, came to be seen as something that only a slave would engage in, and it became almost a sentence, likewise, the only dharma possible for a slave was work. The ancient world did not despise labor because it practiced slavery and because those who work were slaves. On the contrary, since it despised labor, it despised the slave. Since those who worked could not be anything but slaves, the traditional world willed slavery into being in a differentiated, instituted, and regulated into a separated social class the mass of those people whose way of being could only be expressed through work. Labor is pawness, an obscure effort strictly dictated by need, was the opposite of action, the former representing the material, heavy, dark pole, the latter the free pole of human possibilities detached from need. Free men and slaves, after all, represented the social crystallization of those two ways of performing an action, either according to matter or wit, that I have already discussed. We do not need to look elsewhere to find the basis for the contempt for work and of the view of hierarchy typical of the constitutions of an intermediate type. In such a world, speculative action, asceticism, contemplation, sometimes even play in war, characterize the pole of action vis a vis the servile pole of work.
Esoterically speaking, the limitations that slavery put on the possibilities of an individual who happened to be born in this condition correspond to the nature of his given destiny, of which slavery should be considered sometimes the natural consequence. On the plane of mythological transpositions, the Jewish tradition is not too far from a similar view when it considers work as a consequence of Adam's fall and, at the same time, as an exploit of this transcendental fall taking place in human existence. On this basis, when Catholicism tried to turn work into an instrument of purification, it partially echoed the general idea of the ritual offering of an action conformed to one's nature. In this context, the nature of fallen man according to the Judeo-Christian view of life as a path of liberation. In antiquity, the vanquished were often assigned the functions of slaves. Was this barbarian style materialism? Yes and no. Once more, we should not forget the truth that permeated the traditional world. Nothing happens on this earth that is not the symbol in the parallel effect of spiritual events, since between spirit and reality, hence power to, allegedly there was an intimate relationship. As a particular consequence of this truth, it has already been mentioned that winning or losing were never considered as mere coincidences. There still remains today among primitive populations the ancient belief that the person afflicted by misfortunes is always a guilty person. The outcomes of every struggle and every war are always mystical signs or the results of a divine judgment, and therefore capable of revealing or unfolding a human destiny. Starting with this presupposition, it is possible to go further and establish a transcendental convergence of meanings between the traditional view of the vanquished and the Jewish view of the sinner, as they both inherit a fate befitting the dharma of the slave, namely, work. This convergence is inspired by the fact that Adam's fault is associated with a defeat he suffered in a symbolic event, the attempt to come into possession of the fruit of the tree, which may yet have had a victorious outcome. We know of myths in which the winning of the fruits of the tree or of things symbolically equivalent, the woman, the golden fleece, etc., is achieved by other heroes, Heracles, Jason, Siegfried, and does not lead them to damnation, as in the Judy Christian myth, but rather to immortality or to a transcendent knowledge. If the modern world has disapproved of the injustice of the caste system, it has stigmatized much more by those ancient civilizations that practice slavery, recent times boasts of having championed the principle of human dignity. This too is mere rhetoric. Let us set aside the fact that Europeans reintroduced and maintained slavery up to the 19th century in their overseas colonies in such heinous forms as to be rarely found in the ancient world. What should be emphasized is that if there ever was a civilization of slaves on a grand scale, the one in which we are living is it. No traditional civilization ever saw such great masses of people condemned to perform shallow, impersonal, automatic jobs. In the contemporary slave system, the counterparts of figures such as lords or enlightened rulers are nowhere to be found. This slavery is imposed slowly through the tyranny of the economic factor and through the absurd structures of a more or less collectivized society. And since the modern view of life and its materialism has taken away from the single individual any possibility of bestowing on his destiny a transfiguring element and seeing it a sign and a symbol, contemporary slavery should therefore be reckoned as one of the gloomiest and most desperate kinds of all times. It is not a surprise that in the masses of modern slaves the obscure forces of world subversion have found an easy, obtuse instrument to pursue their goals. While in the places where it has already triumphed the vast stalinist, war camps testify to how the physical and moral sub of man to the goals of collectivization and of the uprooting of every value of the personality is employed in a methodical and even satanic way. In addition to the previous considerations concerning work as art in the world of tradition, I will briefly mention the organic, functional, and consistent quality of the objects produced by virtue of which the beautiful did not appear as something separated or distinct from a certain privileged category of artistic effects and the mere utilitarian and mercantile character of the objects was totally lacking. Every object had its own beauty and a qualitative value, as well as its own function as a useful object. With regard to art in the traditional world, while on the one hand what occurred was a. the prodigy of the unification of the opposites, b. The utter compliance with a set of established rules in which every personal lawn appears to be sacrificed and suffocated and see 
The authentic arising of spirituality within an authentic, personal creation and strategy of the unifinition innovation of the op the utter compliance with the set of established in which every personal alone appears to be sacrificed and suffocated and sent a rising of a spirituality within an authentic personal what occurred was a the prodigence of the prodigal on the one hand what a personal career unify of it and on the other hand, it could be rightly said that every object did not have the imprint of an individual artistic personality, as happens today with the so-called artistic objects. Yet while revealing a choral taste, which makes of the object one of many, infinite expressions, it had the seal of a spiritual genuineness that prevented it from being called a copy. Such products were witness to one stylistic personality whose creative activity developed through centuries. Even when a name, whether real, fictitious, or symbolic was known, this was considered irrelevant. Anonymity, not of a subpersonal but of a superpersonal character, was therefore upheld on the soil what was born and proliferated in all the domains of life or artisans' creations that were far from both a shallow, plebeian sense of utility and an extrinsic, a functional, artificial beauty. This session reflects the overall inorganic character of modern civilization. Chapter 16 By Partition of the Traditional Spirit, Ceticism Having explained the spirit that animated the caste system, it is now necessary to discuss the path that is above the castes and is directed at implementing the realization of transcendence in analogous terms to those of high initiation, yet outside the specific and rigorous structures characterizing it. On the one hand, the pariah is a person without a caste, the one who has lapsed or who has eluded the form by being powerless before it, thus returning to the infernal world. The ascetic, on the other hand, is a being above the caste, one who becomes free from the form by renouncing the illusory center of human individuality. He turns toward the principle from which every form proceeds, not by faithfulness to his own nature and by participation in the hierarchy, but by direct action. Therefore, as great as was the revulsion harbored by every caste toward the pariah in India, so, I contrast, was the veneration felt by everybody for a person who was above the caste. These beings, according to a Buddhist image, should not be expected to follow human dharma, just as one who is trying to kindle a fire ultimately does not care what kind of wood is being employed, as long as it is capable of producing fire and light. Asceticism occupies an ideal intermediary state between the plane of direct, Olympian, and initiatory regality and the plane of right and of dharma. Asceticism also presents the features or qualifications that from a broader perspective may be considered as qualifications of the same traditional spirit. The first aspect of the ascetic path is action, understood as heroic action. The second aspect is asceticism in the technical sense of the word, especially with reference to the path of contemplation. Beyond complete traditional forms and in more recent times some civilizations have arisen that were inspired in different degrees by either one of these two poles. Later on we shall see what role the two aspects have played in the dynamism of historical forces, even on the plane that is related to the ethnic and racial factor. In order to grasp the spirit of an ascetical tradition at a pure state it is necessary to leave out of consideration the meanings that have been associated with the term asceticism in the world of Western religiosity. Action and knowledge are to fundamental human faculties. In both domains it is possible to accomplish an integration capable of removing human limitations. The asceticism of contemplation consists of the integration of the knowing faculty, achieved through detachment from sensible reality, with the neutralization of individual rationalizing faculties and with the progress of stripping of the nucleus of consciousness, which thus becomes free from conditionings and subtracts itself from the limitation and from the necessity of any determination, whether real or virtual. Once all the dross and obstructions are removed, opus ramatoinus, participation in the overworld takes place in the form of a vision or an enlightenment. As the peak of the ascetical path, this point also represents, at the same time, the beginning of a truly continuous, progressive ascent that realizes states of being truly superior to the human condition. The essential ideals of the ascetical path are the universal as knowledge and knowledge as liberation. The ascetical detachment typical of the contemplative path implies renunciation. In this regard, it is necessary to prevent the misunderstanding occasioned by some inferior forms of asceticism. It is important to emphasize the different meanings that renunciation assumed in higher forms of ancient and eastern asceticism on the one hand, and in most of western and especially Christian asceticism on the other hand. In the latter, 
Renunciation often assumed the character of a repression and of a mortification. The Christian ascetic becomes detached from the objects of desire not because he no longer has any desire, but in order to mortify himself and to escape temptation. In the former, renunciation proceeds from a natural distaste for objects that are usually attractive and yearned for. This distaste is motivated by the fact that one directly desires, or better, wills, something the world of conditioned experience cannot grant. In this case, what leads to renunciation is the natural nobility of one's desire rather than an external intervention aimed at slowing down, mortify, and inhibiting the faculty of desire to vulgar nature. After all, the emotional phase, even in its purest and noblest forms, is only found at the introductory levels in higher forms of asceticism. In later stages, it is consumed by the intellectual fire and by the arid splendor of pure contemplation. A typical example of contemplative asceticism is given by early Buddhism in its lack of religious features, its organization in a pure system of techniques, and in the spirit that animates it, which is so different from what anyone may think about asceticism. First of all, Buddhism does not know any gods in the religious sense of the word. The gods are believed to be powers who also need liberation, and thus the awakened one is acknowledged to be superior to both men and gods. In the Buddhist canon it is written that an ascetic not only becomes free from human bonds, but from divine bonds as well. Secondly, moral norms, in the original forms of Buddhism, the fundamental principle of the method is knowledge, to turn the knowledge of the ultimate non-identity of the self with anything else, whether it be the monastic or the world of Brahmo, theistically conceived, into a fire that progressively devours any irrational self-identification with anything that is conditioned. In conformity to the path, the final outcome, Besides the negative designation, nirvana, cessation of restlessness, is expressed in terms of knowledge, bodhi, which is knowledge in the eminent sense of super-rational enlightenment or liberating knowledge, as in waking up from sleep, slumber, or hallucination. It goes without saying that this is not the equivalent of the cessation of power of anything resembling a dissolution. To dissolve ties is not to become dissolved but to become free. The image of the one who, once freed from all yokes, whether human or divine, is supremely autonomous and thus may go wherever he pleases, is found very frequently in the Buddhist canon together with all kinds of symbols of a virile and warrior type, and also with constant and explicit reference not so much to non-being but rather to something superior to both being and non-being. Udo, as it is well known, belonged to an ancient stock of Aryan warrior nobility and his doctrine, purported to be the Dharma of the Pure Ones, inaccessible to an uninstructed, average person, is a very far cry from any mystical escapism. Buddha's doctrine is permeated by a sense of superiority, clarity, and an indomitable spirit, and Buddha himself is called the fully self-awakened one, the Lord. The Buddhist renunciation is of a virile and aristocratic type and is animated by an inner strength. It is not dictated by need but is consciously willed, so that the person practicing it may overcome need and become reintegrated into a perfect life. It is understandable that when our contemporaries, who only know a life that is mixed with non-life, that in its restlessness presence, the irrational traits of a mania, hear mention of nirvana, in reference to the condition experienced by the awakened one, namely, of an extinction of mania corresponding to what the Germans call more than living, Mare Ailes Leben, and to a super life, they cannot help but equate nirvana with nothingness, for non-mania, nirvana, means non-life, or nothingness. After all, it is only natural that the modern spirit has relegated the values cherished by higher asceticism to the things of the past. A Western example of pure contemplative asceticism is given by Neoplatonism, with the words, The gods ought to come to me, not I to them, Plotinus indicated a fundamental aspect of aristocratic asceticism. Also, with the sayings, it is to the gods, not to good men, that we are to be made like, and, our concern, though, is not to be out of sin, but to be God, Plotinus has definitely overcome the limitations posed by morality, and has employed the method of inner simplification, oplosis, as a way to become free from all conditionings in that state of metaphysical simplicity from which the vision will eventually arise. By means of this vision, having joined as it were center to center, what occurs is the participation in that intelligible reality that compared to which any other reality may be characterized as more non life than life, with the sensible impressions appearing as dreams in the world of bodies as the place of radical powerlessness and of the inability to be.
Another example is given by the so-called Rhineland mysticism that was capable of reaching metaphysical peaks towering above and beyond Christian theism. Thor's interesting corresponds to Plotinus at Plusus and to the destruction of the element of becoming, or samsric element, that Buddhism regarded as the condition necessary to achieve awakening. The aristocratic view of contemplative asceticism reappears in the doctrine of Meister Eckhart. Like Buddha, Eckhart addressed the noble man and the noble soul whose metaphysical dignity is witnessed by the presence of a strength, a light, and a fire within it, in other words, of something before which even the deity conceived as a person isle, theistically, becomes something exterior. The method he employed consisted essentially of detachment from all things, a virtue that according to Eckhart is above love, humility, or miscellaneous, as he explained in his sermon on detachment. The principle of spiritual centrality was affirmed. The true self is God. God is our real center and we are external only to ourselves. Fear, hope, anguish, void, and pain, or anything that may bring us out of ourselves, must be allowed to seep into us. An action dictated by desire, even when its goal is the kingdom of heaven itself, eternal life, or the beatific vision, must not be undertaken. The path suggested by a cart leads from the outside to the inside, beyond everything that is mere image, beyond things and what represents the quality of a thing, denite, beyond forms and the quality of form, formalkeet, beyond essences and essentiality. From the gradual extinction of all images and forms, and eventually of one's own thoughts, well, and knowledge, what arises is a transformed and supernatural knowledge that is carried beyond all forms or form. Thus one reaches a peak in respect to which God himself, always according to his theistic view, appears as something ephemeral, that is, as a transcendent and uncreate peak of the self without which God himself could not exist. All the typical images of the religious consciousness are swallowed up by a reality that is an absolute, pure possession, and that in its simplicity cannot help but to appear terrifying to any finite being. Once again we find a solar symbol. Before this barren and absolute substance, God appears as the moon next to the sun. The divine light in comparison with the radiance of this substance pales, just as the sun's light outshines the moon's. After this brief mention of the meaning of contemplative asceticism, it is necessary to say something about the other path, namely, the path of action. While in contemplative asceticism we find a mostly inner process in which the theme of detachment and the direct orientation toward transcendence are predominant, in the second case we have an imminent process aimed at awakening the deepest forces of the human being and at bringing them to the limit, thus causing a super-life to spring from life itself in a context of absolute intensity. This is the heroic life according to the sacred meaning and oft its blade in the traditional Eastern and Western worlds. The nature of such a realization causes it to present simultaneously an outer and an inner, a visible and an invisible aspect. Conversely, pure contemplative asceticism may also lie entirely in a domain that is not connected to the external world by something tangible. When the two poles of the ascetical path are not separated and neither one becomes the dominating trait of a particular type of civilization, but on the contrary, both poles are present and joined together, then the ascetical element feeds in an invisible way the forces of centrality and stability of a traditional organism. While the heroic element enjoys a greater relationship with the dynamism and the force animating its structures. In relation to the path of action, in the next chapters I will discuss the doctrine of the holy war and the role played by games in antiquity. I will further develop the topic of heroic action given the interest it should evoke in western man who, by virtue of his own nature, is more inclined to act than to contemplate. Chapter 17. The Greater and the Lesser Holy War Considering that in the traditional view of the world every reality was a symbol and every action a ritual, the same was true in the case of war, since war could take on a sacred character, holy war and the path to God became one and the same thing. In more or less explicit forms, this concept is found in many traditions. A religious aspect and a transcendent intent were often associated with the bloody and military deeds of traditional humanity. Livy relates that the same warriors looked like initiates. Similarly, among savage populations the magical and the warrior elements are often intermingled. In ancient Mexico, the bestowal of the title of commander Tecoleo was subordinated to the successful outcome of difficult trials of an initiatory type. Also, until recent times, the Japanese warrior nobility, the samurai, was to a large degree inspired by the doctrines and asceticism of Zen, an esoteric form of Buddhism. The ancient world Vian myths, in which the theme of antagonism repeatedly occurred, 
automatically propelled the elevation of the art of war to a spiritual plane. This was the case of the Persian Aryan tradition and also of the Hellenic world, which often saw material war for the reflection of a perennial cosmic struggle between the spiritual and Iranian element of the cosmos on the one hand, and the titanic, demonic feminine unrestrained elements of chaos on the other hand. This interpretation is possible especially in those instances where war was associated with the idea of the empire, and also because of the transcendent meaning this concept evoked. It was then translated into a very powerful idea, the symbolism of Heracles' labors, he being the hero fighting on the side of the Olympian forces, was applied to as late a figure as Frederick I of Hohenschaufen. Social views concerning one's fate in the afterlife introduce us to the inner meanings of warrior asceticism. According to the Aztec and Nahua races, the highest seat of immortality, the house of the sun or the house of Hutzlopakli, was reserved not only for sovereigns but for heroes as well, as far as ordinary people were concerned. They were believed to slowly fade away in a place analogous to the Hellenic Hades. The Nordic Aryan mythology conceived of Hal as the seat of heavenly immortality reserved for the heroes fallen on the battlefield, in addition to nobles and free men of divine origin. This seat was related to the symbolism of heights as Glenorjorg, the resplendent mountain, Ordmanjorg, the heavenly mountain, the highest divine mountain on whose peaks an eternal brightness shines beyond the clouds, and was often identified with Osgard, namely, with the SS seat located in the middle land, MIT Guard. The lord of this seat was Odin Woden, the Nordic god of war and victory. According to a particular myth, Odin was the king who with his sacrifice showed to the heroes the path that leads to the divine dwellings where they will live forever and be transformed into his sins. Thus, according to the Nordic races, no sacrifice or cult was more cherished by the supreme god and thought to bear more supernatural fruits than the one celebrated by the hero who falls on the battlefield. From a declaration of war to its bloody conclusion, the religious element permeated the Germanic host and inspired the individual war as well. Moreover, in these traditions we find the idea that by means of a heroic death the war is shifted from the plane of the material, or through war to the plane of struggle of a transcendent and universal character. The host of heroes were believed to constitute the so-called wild here, the mounted stormtroopers jed by Odin who take off from the peak of Mount Valhalla and then return to rest on it. In the higher forms of this tradition, the host of the dead heroes selected by the Valkyrie for Odin, with whom the wilds here eventually became identified, was the army the god needed in order to fight against the Ragnaraka, the twilight of the gods that has been approaching for a very long time. It is written in, there is a very large number of dead heroes in Valhalla, and many more have yet to come, and yet they will seem to few when the wolf comes. What has been said so far concerns the transformation of the war into a holy war. Now I wish to add some specific references found in other traditions. In the Islamic tradition a distinction is made between two holy wars, the greater holy war, el al akbar and the lesser holy war, el al akshar This distinction originated from a saying, hadith, of the Prophet, who on the way back from a military expedition said, You have returned from a lesser holy war to the greater holy war. The greater holy war is of an inner and spiritual nature. The other is the material war waged externally against an enemy population with the particular intent of bringing infidel populations under the rule of God's law, al Islam. The relationship between the greater and the lesser holy war, however, mirrors the relationship between the soul and the body. In order to understand the heroic asceticism or path of action, it is necessary to recognize the situation in which the two paths merge, the lesser holy war becoming the means through which a greater holy war is carried out and vice versa, the little holy war, or the external one, becomes almost a ritual action that expresses and gives witness to the reality of the first. Originally, Orthodox Islam conceived the unitary form of asceticism, that which is connected to the jihad or holy war, the greater holy war is man's struggle against the enemies he carries within. More exactly, it is the struggle of man's higher principle against everything that is merely human in him, against his inferior nature and against chaotic impulses and all sorts of material attachments. This is expressly outlined in a text of Aryan warrior wisdom. Know him therefore who is above reason, and let his peace give thee peace. Be a warrior and kill desire, the powerful enemy of the soul. The enemy who resists us and the infidel within ourselves must be subdued and put in chains. This enemy is the animalistic yearning and instincts, the disorganized multiplicity of impulses, 
the limitations imposed on us by a fictitious self, and thus also fear, weakness, and uncertainty. This subduing of the enemy is the only way to achieve inner liberation or the rebirth in a state of a deeper inner unity and peace in the esoteric and triumphal sense of the word. In the world of traditional warrior asceticism, the lesser holy war, namely, the external war, is indicated and even prescribed as the means to wage this greater holy war. Thus in Islam the expressions holy war, jihad, and Allah's way are often used interchangeably. In this order of ideas, action exercises the rigorous function and task of a sacrificial and purifying ritual. The external vicissitudes experienced during a military campaign cause the inner enemy to emerge and to put up a fierce resistance and a good fight in the form of the animalistic instincts of self-preservation, fear, inertia, compassion, or other passions. Those who engage in battles must overcome these feelings by the time they enter the battlefield if they wish to win and to defeat the outer enemy or the infidel. Obviously the spiritual orientation and the right intention here, that is, the one toward transcendence, the symbols employed to refer to transcendence are heaven, paradise, Allah's gardens and so on, are presupposed as the foundations of jihad, lest war lose its sacred character and degenerate into a wild affair in which true heroism is replaced with reckless abandonment and what counts are the only impulses of the animalistic nature. It is written in the Quran, Let those who would exchange the life of this world for the hereafter fight for the cause of Allah, whether they die or conquer, we shall richly reward them. The presupposition according to which it is prescribed, when you meet the unbelievers in the battlefield strike off their heads, and when you have laid them low, bind your captives firmly, or do not falter or sue for peace when you have gained the upper hand, is that the life of this world is but a sport and a pastime in that whoever is unto this cause is unto himself. These statements should be interpreted along the lines of the evangelical saying, Whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16.25 This is confirmed by yet another Quranic passage, why is it that when it is said to you, March in the cause of Allah, you linger slothfully in the land? Are we content with this life in preference to the life to come? Say, are you waiting for anything to befall us except victory or martyrdom? Another passage is relevant as well. Fighting is obligatory for you, as much as you dislike it. But you may hate a thing although it is good for you, and love a thing although it is bad for you. Allah knows but you do not. This passage should also be connected with the following one. They were content to be with those who stayed behind, a seal was set upon their hearts, leaving them bereft of understanding. But the apostle and the men who shared his faith thought with their goods and their persons. These shall be rewarded with good things, they shall surely prosper. Allah has prepared for them gardens watered by running streams, in which they shall abide forever. That is the supreme triumph. This place of rest, paradise, symbolizes the super-individual states of being, the realization of which is not confined to the post-mortem alone, as the following passage indicates. As for those who are slain in the cause of Allah, he will not allow their works to perish. He will vie them guidance and ennoble their state. He will admit them to the paradise he has to made known to them. In the instance of real death and battle, we find the equivalent of the Morse trompa as found in classical traditions. Those who have experienced the greater holy war during the lesser holy war have awakened a power that most likely will help them overcome the crisis of death. This power, having already liberated them from the enemy and from the infidel, will help them avoid the fate of Hades. This is why in classical antiquity the hope of the deceased and the piety of his relatives often caused figures of heroes and of victors to be inscribed on the tombstones. It is possible, however, to go through death and conquer, as well as achieve, the super-life and to ascend to the heavenly realm while being alive. The Islamic formulation of the heroic doctrine corresponds to that formulated in the Bhagavad Gita, in which the same meanings are expressed in a pure way. The doctrine of liberation through pure action, which is expounded in this text, is declared to be solar in origin and is believed to have been communicated by the founder of the present cycle to dynasties of sacred kings rather than to priest Brahmana. The piety that keeps the warrior own from going to battle against his enemies, since he recognizes among them his own relatives and teachers, is characterized by the Bhagavad Gita as lifeless did. The text adds, Strong men do not know despair, for that wins neither heaven nor earth. The promise is the same, In death thy glory in heaven, in victory thy glory on earth. Eyes therefore, with thy soul ready to fight. The inner attitude, the equivalent of the Islamic Dia, 
that is capable of transforming the lesser war into a greater holy war is described in clear terms. Offer to me all thy works and rest thy mind on the supreme. Be free from vain hopes and selfish thoughts, and with inner peace fight thou thy fight. The purity of this type of action, which must be willed for its own sake, is also celebrated in clear terms. Prepare for war with peace in thy soul. Be in peace and pleasure and pain, and gain and in loss, in victory or in the loss of a battle. In this peace there is no sin. In other words, you will not stray from the supernatural direction by fulfilling your dharma as a warrior. The relationship between war and the path to God is present in the Gita too, though the metaphysical rather than the ethical aspect is more heavily stressed, the worry reproduces somewhat the deity's transcendence. The teaching Christian imparts to own concerns first of all the distinction between what is pure and undying in that which, as a human and naturalistic element, only appears to exist. The unreal never is, the real never is not, this truth indeed has been seen by those who can see the true. Interwoven in his creation, the spirit is beyond destruction. No one can bring to an end the spirit which is everlasting. If any man thinks he slay, and if another thinks he is slain, neither knows the ways of truth. The eternal in man cannot kill, the eternal in man cannot die. He does not die when the body dies, these bodies have an end in their time, but he remains immeasurable, immortal. Therefore, great worry, carry on thy fight. The consciousness of the irreality of what can be lost or caused to be lost as ephemeral life and as mortal body, the equivalent of the Islamic view that this life is just a sport and a pastime, is associated with the knowledge of that aspect of the divine according to which this aspect is an absolute power before which every conditioned existence appears as a negation. This power becomes naked and dazzles in a terrible theophany precisely in the act of destruction in the act that negates the negation, in the whirlwind that sweeps away every finite life, either destroying it or making it arise again in a transhuman state. In order to free own from doubt and from the soft bond of the soul, Krishna says, I am the life of all living beings and the austere life of those who train their souls. And I am from everlasting the seed of eternal life. I am the intelligence of the intelligent. I am the beauty of the beautiful. In the end, having abandoned all personifications, Krishna manifests himself in the wonderful and fearful form before which the three worlds tremble, fast, reaching the sky, burning with many colors, with wide open mouths, with fast flaming eyes. Finite beings, as lamps outshone by a much greater source of light, or as circuits pervaded by a much greater current, give way, disintegrate, melt, because in their midst there is now a power transcending their form, that will something infinitely greater than anything that as individual agents they may will by themselves. This is why finite beings become, being transformed and going from the manifested into the unmanifested, from the material to the immaterial. On this basis the power capable of producing the heroic realization is clearly defined. The values are overturned, death becomes a witness to life, and the destructive power of time displays the indomitable nature hidden inside what is subject to time and death. Hence the meaning of these words uttered by Owen at the moment in which he experiences the deity as pure transcendence. As roaring torrents of waters rush forward into the ocean, so do these heroes of our mortal world rush into thy flaming mouths. And as moss swiftly rushing enter a burning flame and die, so all these men rush to thy fire, rush fast to their own destruction. Christian also added, I am all-powerful time which destroys all things, and I have come here to slay these men. Even if thou dost not fight, all the warriors facing thee shall die. Rise therefore, win thy glory, conquer thy enemies, and enjoy thy kingdom. Through fate of their own karma I have doomed them to die. Be thou merely the means of my work. Tremble not, fight and slay them. Thou shalt conquer thy enemies in battle. In this way we find again the identification of war with the path to God. The warrior evokes in himself the transcendent power of destruction. He takes it on, he comes transfigured and infant free, thus breaking loose from all human bonds. Life is like a bow and the soul like an arrow, the target being aimed at is the Supreme Spirit. Another text of the same Hindu tradition says that what matters is to become united with the Supreme, as an arrow is united with its target. This is the metaphysical justification of war on the transformation of the lesser into the greater holy war. It also sheds further light on the meaning of the traditions concerning the transformation, in the course of the battle, of a warrior or a king into a god. According to an Egyptian tradition, Ramses Marian was transformed in the battlefield into the god Amon and said, I am like Baal in his own time. When his enemies recognized him in the melee, they cried out, This is not a man, 
He is Saku, the great warrior. He is Ball in the flesh. In this context, Ball is the equivalent of the Vedic Shiva and Indra, of the sword god to use Tyre, who is represented by a sword and by the Runewai, which is the hidden realm of resurrection, a man with raged arms, and of Odin Woden, the god of battles and of victories. It should not be forgotten that both Indra and Woden are conceived of as gods of order, as the overseers of the world's course, Indra is called the one who stems the tides. As the god of the day and of clear skies, he also exhibits Olympian traits. What we find in these examples is the general theme of war being justified as a reflection of the transcendent war waged by a form against chaos and the forces of the inferior nature that accompany it. Further on, I will discuss the classical Western forms of the path of action. As far as the Western doctrine of the Holy War is concerned, I will refer here only to the Crusades. The fact that during the Crusades men who fought the war intensely and experienced it according to the same spiritual meaning were found on both sides demonstrates the true unity between people who shared the same traditional spirit. A unity that can be preserved not only through differences of opinion but also through the most dramatic contrast. In their rising up in arms against each other, Islam and Christianity gave witness to the unity of the traditional spirit. The historical context in which the Crusades took place abounds with elements capable of conferring upon them a potential symbolic and spiritual meaning. The conquest of the Holy Land located beyond the sea in reality had many more connections with ancient traditions than it was first thought. According to these traditions, in the ancient east, where the sun rises, there lies the happy region of the Assezin in it, the city of Ard, where there is no death and where journeyers enjoy a heavenly peace and eternal life. Moreover, the struggle against Islam, by virtue of its nature, shared from the beginning several common traits with asceticism. It was not a matter of fighting for earthly kingdoms, but for the kingdom of God. The Crusades were not a human, but a divine affair. Consequently, they should not be considered like all other human events. The Holy War was at that time the equivalent of a spiritual war and of a cleansing that is almost a purgatorial fire that one experiences before death. To use an expression found in a chronicle of those times. Popes and preachers compared those who died in the Crusades to gold tested three times and purified seven times in the furnace. The fallen warriors were believed to find grace with the Supreme Lord. In his day, Laud Navi Milidae, St. Bernard wrote, Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. What a glory it is for you to emerge from the battle crown with victory. But what a greater glory it is to win on the battlefield an immortal crown. What a truly blessed condition, when one can wait for death without any fear, yearning for it and welcoming it with a strong spirit. The crusader was promised a share in the absolute glory and rest in paradise, in the coarse language of the time, conquerlet and paradis, which is the same kind of supernatural rest mentioned in the Quran. Likewise, Jerusalem, the military objective of the crusades, appeared in the double aspect of an earthly and of a heavenly city. And thus the crusade became the equivalent in terms of heroic tradition of a ritual, a pilgrimage, and the passion of the via crucis. Moreover, those who belonged to the orders that contributed the most to the crusades, such as the Knights Templar and the Knights of St. John, were men who, like the Christian monks or ascetics, learned to despise the vanity of this life. These orders were the natural retirement place for those warriors who were weary of the world, who had seen and experienced just about everything, and who had directed their spiritual quest towards something higher. The teaching that Vitaeus Militia Super Terram was instilled in these knights in an integral, inner and outer fashion. Through praise they readied themselves to fight and to move against the enemy. Their maddens was the trumpet, their hair shirts, the armor they rarely took off, their fortresses, the monasteries, the trophies taken from the infidels, the relics and the images of saints. A similar kind of asceticism paved the way for that spiritual realization that was also related to the secret dimension of chivalry. The military defeats the Crusaders suffered, after an initial surprise and perplexity, helped to purify the Crusades from any residue of materialism and to focus on the inner rather than on the outer dimension, on the spiritual rather than on the temporal element. By comparing the unfortunate outcome of a Crusade with that of an unnoticed virtue, which is appreciated and rewarded only in the next life, people learn to see something superior to both winning and losing and to put all their values in the ritual and sacrificial aspect of an action as an end in itself, which is performed independently from the visible earthly results as a noble aimed at deriving the life-giving, absolute glory from the sacrifice of the human element. Therefore, in the Crusades we find the recurrence of the main meanings of expression such as 
Paradise lies under the shade of the swords, and the blood of the heroes is closer to God than the ink of the philosophers and the prayers of the faithful, as well as the view of the seed of immortality as the Ion of heroes, or Valhalla, and as the court of heroes. What occurs again is the same spirit that animated the warrior in Zoroastrian dualism. By virtue of this spirit, the followers of Mithras assimilated the exercise of their cult to the military profession. The Nephites swore by an oath sacramentum, similar to that required of the recruits in the army, and once a man joined the ranks of the initiates, he became part of the sacred militia of the invincible god of light. Moreover, it must be emphasized that during the Crusades the realization of universality and of supranationalism through asceticism was eventually achieved. Leaders and nobles from all lands converged into the same sacred enterprise, above and beyond their particular interests and political divisions, to forge a European solidarity informed by the same ecumenical ideal of the Holy Will Roman Empire. The main strength of the Crusades was supplied by chivalry, which, as I have already remarked, was a supernational institution whose members had no homeland because they would go anywhere they could to fight for those principles to which they swore unconditional faithfulness. Since Pope Urban to refer to chivalry as the community of those who sh show up everywhere a conflict erupts, in order to spread the terror that their weapons evoke in defense of honor and justice, he expected chivalry to answer the call to a holy war. Thus, here too we find a convergence of the inner and outer dimensions. In the holy war, the individual was afforded the experience of a meta-individual action. Likewise, the teaming up of war is for a purpose higher than their own race, national interest, or territorial and political concerns was an external expression of the overcoming of all particularities, already an ideal of the Holy Roman Empire. In reality, if the universality connected with the asceticism of the pure spiritual authority is the condition for an invisible traditional unity that exists over and above any political division within the body of a unitary civilization informed by the cosmic and by the eternal, in respect of which everything that is pathos and human inclination disappears and the dimension of the spirit presence the same characteristic of purity and power as the great forces of nature. And when this universality is added to universality as action, then we arrive at the supreme ideal of the empire, an ideal whose unity is both visible and invisible, material and political, as well as spiritual. Baroque asceticism and the untamability of the warrior vocation strengthened by a supernatural direction are the necessary instruments that allow the inner unity to be analogically reflected in the outer unity, namely, in the social body represented by many peoples that are organized and unified by the same one great conquering stock. Moreover, those who love to contrast the past with our recent times should consider what modern civilization has brought us to in terms of war. A change of level has occurred. From the warrior who fights for the honor and for the right of his lord, society has shifted to the type of the mere soldier that is found in association with the removal of all transcendent or even religious elements in the idea of fighting. To fight on, the path to God has been characterized as medieval fanaticism. Conversely, it has been characterized as a most sacred cause to fight for a patriotic and nationalistic ideals and for other myths that in our contemporary era have eventually been unmasked and shown to be the instruments of irrational, materialistic, and destructive forces. It has gradually become possible to see that when country was mentioned, this rallying cry often concealed the plans of annexation and oppression and the interests of monopolistic industries, all talk of heroism was done by those who accompanied soldiers to the train stations. Soldiers went to the front to experience war as something else, namely, as a crisis that all too often did not turn out to be an authentic and heroic transfigure of the personality, but rather the regression of the individual to a plane of savage instincts, reflexes, and reactions that retain very little of the human by virtue of being below and not above humanity. The era of nationalism has known a worthy surrogate for the two great traditional culminations that are the universality of spiritual authority and heroic universality. I am referring to imperialism. Although in society the act of one who takes over somebody else's goods by force, whether out of envy or out of need, is considered to be reprehensible, a similar behavior in the relationships between nations has been considered as a natural and legitimate thing. It has consecrated the notion of fighting and it has constituted the foundation of the imperialistic ideal. It was thought that a poor nation, lacking living space, has every right, if not the duty, to take over the goods and the lands of other people. In some instances, the conditions leading to expansion into imperialist conquest have been fabricated a hawk. A typical example has been the pursuit of demographical growth, inspired by the password, there is power in numbers. 
Another example, more widespread in denoting a lower mentality since it is exclusively controlled by economic and financial factors, is that of overproduction. Once a nation experiences an excess of production and the demographical or commercial need for space, it desperately requires an outlet. When the outlet of a Cold War, diplomatic intrigues are no longer sufficient. What ensues are military expeditions that in my view rank much lower than what the barbaric invasions of the past may have represented. Such an upheaval, which has recently assumed global proportions, is accompanied by hypocritical rhetoric. The great ideas of humanity, democracy, and the right of a people to self-determination have been mobilized. From an external point of view, not only is the idea of holy war considered outdated, but also the understanding of it that people of honor had developed. The heroic ideal has now been lowered to the figure of the policemen because the new crusades have not been able to find a better flag to rally around than that of the struggle against the aggressor. From an inner point of view, beyond all this rhetoric, what proved to be decisive was the brute, cynical will to power of obscure, international, capitalist, and collectivist powers. At the same time, science has promoted an extreme mechanization and technologization of war, so much so that today war is not a matter of man against man but of machines against man. Rational systems of mass extermination are being employed through indiscriminate raids, atomic weapons, and chemical warfare that leave no hope and no way out. Such systems could once have been devised only to exterminate germs and insects. In contrast to medieval superstitions that refer to a holy war, what our contemporaries consider sacred and worthy of the actual progress of civilization is the fact that millions of human beings, taken away en masse from their occupations and vocations, which are totally alien to the military vocation, and literally turned into what military jargon refers to as cannon fodder, will die in such events. Chapter 18. Games and Victory In classical antiquity games, Luda had a sacred character and they therefore became typical expressions of the traditional path of action. Ludum primininidum procorindus relginum estatum, wrote Livy. It was considered dangerous to neglect the sacred games, negligere sacra care trime, thus, if the state's funds were depleted, the games were simplified but never suppressed. In ancient Roman law required the dolor and the idols to have the games celebrated in honor of the gods. The Truvius wanted every city to be endowed with its own theater. Dorum mortalum debus festus lodorum spectus onibus, and originally the person presiding over the games in the Circus Maximus was also the priest of Ceres, Allied, and Libera. In any event, the person in charge of the games in Rome was always a representative of the official patrician religion. In the case of some games, such as the Salii's, special priestly colleges were formed for the occasion. The games were so closely related to pagan temples that Christian emperors had no choice but to keep them open, since shutting them down would have caused those games to be cancelled. These games even outlasted most ancient Roman institutions, and eventually ended with the Roman Empire itself. An agape to which demons were invited, in order to Daimonum, usually closed the games, signifying a ritual participation of the people and the mystical force associated with them. Augustine reported that Ludus Genica. Inter raised in when I doctus imis conscribuntur. The games assumed the character of raised doing that, and they have been replaced today by contemporary sports and by the plebeian infatuation with them. In the Hellenic tradition, the institution of the most important games bore a close relationship with the idea of the struggle of Olympian, hero, and solar forces against natural and elemental forces. The Pythian games in Delphi celebrated Apollo's triumph over Python and the victory of this hyperborean god in the contest with other gods. Likewise, the Olympian games were related to the idea of the triumph of the heavenly race over the race of titans. Heracles, the demigod who was the Ily of the Olympian host in the struggle against the giants, was believed to have instituted the Olympian games and to have symbolically taken the olive branch with which the winners were crowned from the land of the Hyperboreans. These games had a rigorously virile character. Women were absolutely forbidden to attend them. Besides, it was not a coincidence that in the Roman arena several numbers and sacred symbols appeared repeatedly. The three, in the Terne Summinas Matarum on the tops of the three columns, and in the Trace Iratrinus Quinqua Centum Dos Minus Pot Antibus while Antibus three altars for the triple gods, the great, the potent, the prevailing that Tertullian attributed to the great sum of each in triad, the five and the five spider of the Domitian race tracks. The Zodiac's twelve and the number of doors from which the chariots entered and exited in the early empire, the seven in the annual games at the time of the Republic, and the number of altars of the planetary gods in the Circus Maximus, with the sun's pyramid at the top, 
in the total number of rounds of a complete race, and in the eggs, dolphins, or tridents located in each of these seven curricula. Rockefeller has noticed that the egg and the trident symbolically referred to the fundamental dualism of the powers at work in the world. The egg represented the generating matter that encompasses every potentiality, while the trident or seahorse, sacred to Poseidon, Neptune, and a frequent symbol of the waves, expressed the same fecundating phallic and telluric power whereby. According to a tradition reported by Plutarch, the current of the waters of the Nile is thought to represent the fecundating sperm of the primordial male spilled on Isis, herself a symbol of the land of Egypt. This duality was reflected in the very location where the ancient games and aquarium horse races dedicated to Mars were held. Carquinus had his circus built in the valley between the Aventine and the Palatine, which was sacred to Mercy, a feminine telluric goddess. The tract of the aquarium began at the Tiber's banks and the finish line was marked with swords planted into Mars' field. Thus, heroic and virile symbols were found at the end of the tracks telos, while the feminine and the material element of generation, namely, flowing waters or whatever was sacred to thonic deities, was found at the beginning of and alongside the tracks. In this way, action took place in the context of material symbols representing higher meanings, so that the magical method and technique hidden in the Loda, which always began with solemn sacrifices and were often celebrated to invoke divine powers at times of an imminent national danger, could have a greater efficacy. The impetus of the horses and the vertigo of the race through seven rounds, which was also compared with and consecrated to the sun's journey in the sky, evoked the mystery of the cosmic current at work in the cycle of generation according to the planetary hierarchy. The ritual slaying of the victorious horse, which was consecrated to Mars, should be connected to the general idea of sacrifice. It seems that the force that was consequently unleashed was for the most part directed by the Romans to increase the crops in an occult fashion, at frugal momentum. This sacrifice may be considered as the equivalent of the Indo-Aryan Asimida, which originally was a magical, ritual, propitiating power. The Roman ritual was celebrated in extraordinary occasions, for instance at the time of declaration of war after a victory. Two horsemen entered into the arena, one from the east and the other from the west, to engage in mortal combat. The original colors of the two factions, which were the same colors of the Orphokovsic egg, white symbolizing winter and red symbolizing summer, or better, the former symbolizing the lunathonic power, the latter the solar Iranian power, evoked the struggle of the two great elemental forces. Every goal, Metasudans, was considered as a living thing, Lithosemsinquis. The altar erected in honor of the god consists, he who gathers in, a demon who fed on the blood spilled in the violent games, or mare, at one of the finish lines of the circus, which was unveiled only on the occasion of the games, appeared as the outlet of infernal forces, just like its Etruscan counterpart, Pudda. Higher up, statues as triumphant deities were erected, which referred to the opposite Iranian principle, so that the circus was transformed into a council of new men, Daimon Conkillum, whose invisible presence was writ sanctioned by seats left purposely vacant. What on the one hand appeared as the unfolding of action in an athletic, competitive, or scenic event, on the other hand was elevated to the plane of a magical evocation. The risk inherent in this evocation was real in a wider order than that of the lives of the participants in the care time, whose victory renewed and strengthened in the individual and in the collectivity the victory of the Iranian forces over the infernal forces, a victory that became transformed into a principle of destiny, for instance. A Poles games were instituted on the occasion of the Punic Wars as a protection against the danger foretold by the Oracle. They were repeated to ward off an epidemic of plague, and eventually it came to be celebrated periodically. Thus, during the parade preceding the games, the images XOI of the capital gods, protectors of Rome, were solemnly carried from the capital to the circus in consecrated chariots tensai. Special regard was paid to the XOI of Jovi's Optima Maxini, the Thunderbolt, the scepter surmounted by the eagle, and the golden crown, which were also the symbols of the impi. This was done with the assumption that the same occult power inherent in Roman sovereignty witnessed to and participated in the games consecrated to it, Loda Romani, or that it was involved in them. The magistrate who was elected to preside over the games led the parade that carried the divine symbols as if he were a conqueror. He was surrounded by his people and followed by a public slave holding over his head a crown of oak leaves encrusted with gold and diamonds. It is probable that in the early games, the quadri was a symbol of Jupiter's attributes and an insignia of triumphal royalty. An ancient quadri of Etruscan origins kept in a Capitoline temple was considered by the Romans as a pledge of their future prosperity. This explains why those games that were not performed according to tradition were looked down upon as unorthodox sacred rituals. 
If the representation were upset by an accident or interrupted for any reason, it was considered a gnomon of bad luck and a curse, and the games had to be started all over again in order to placate the divine powers. Conversely, according to a famous legend, when the people, following a surprise attack by the enemy, left the games, which in the meantime were not interrupted, in order to take up arms, they found the enemy miraculously routed by a supernatural power that was later on identified with the power evoked by the rite of the game dedicated to the savior Apollo. If the games were often consecrated to victories that personified the triumphant power, their purpose was to renew the life and presence of such a power, to nourish it with the new energies that were awakened and that imparted the same direction. This explains why, in specific reference to the care time and to the mare, the winner appeared to be endowed with a divine character and at times to be a temporary incarnation of a deity. In Olympia, in the moment of triumph, the winner was thought to be an incarnation of the local Zeus, and the public acclamation to the victorious gladiator was incorporated into the ancient Christian liturgy, Isianus P. Oenus forever and ever. What should really be considered in this context is what kind of inner, besides ritual and magical, meaning the event may have had for the individual been said about the notion of holy war applies in this context as well. The heroic exulta found in competition and in victory. Once it was given a ritual meaning, became the imitation of, or the introduction to, that higher and pure impetus the initiate used to defeat death. This explains the frequent references to the Kirtimena, to the games of the circus, and to the figures of winners in classical funerary art. All these references immortalized in an analogical way the highest hope of the deceased, and visibly portrayed the kind of action most likely to help him overcome Hades and obtain the glory of an eternal life in a way conforming to the traditional path of action. What we find over and over again in sarcophagi, funerary urns, and classical bus reliefs are the images of a triumphal death. Winged victories open the doors of the other world's domain, or uphold the medallion of the deceased or crown him with the evergreen that usually crowns the heads of the initiates. In the context of the Pindaric celebration of the divinity of victorious wrestlers, the Inagogues and the Promachi were portrayed as mystical deities leading the souls to immortality. And vice versa, in Orphism, every victory, Nike, became the symbol of the victory of the soul over the body, and those who achieved initiation were called the heroes of a dramatic and endless struggle. Therefore, in the sepulchral images, Heracles, Theseus, the Dioscuri, Achilles, and others are designated as Orphic initiates. Stratos, Belisha, and Lot is the term designating the host of initiates, and Anas Stratos the term designating the mysteries Hierophant. Light, victory, and initiation were eventually represented next to each other in several Hellenic monuments. Hulas, as the rising sun, alias Aurora, is a Nike and is endowed with a triumphal chariot. Other Nike were talents, this, this, and other deities are personifications of the transcendent rebirth. When we go from the symbolic and esoteric to the magical aspect, it should be noted that the competitions and the warrior dances celebrated on the occasion of a hero's death. The Roman equivalent were the ludus celebrated at the funerals of major figures, had the purpose of awakening a mystical, saving force that was supposed to accompany and strengthen him during the crisis that occurred at the moment of death. People also paid homage to the heroes by periodically repeating the contests that follow their funerals. All this is typical of a traditional civilization qualified by the pull of action rather than by the pull of contemplation. Action is spirit and spirit is action. As far as Greece is concerned, I have already mentioned that in Olympia, action in the form of games exercise a unifying function beyond the particularism of the city-state similar to that function manifested through action as holy war, as in the case of the supernational phenomena of the Crusades or, in the context of Islam, during the period of the first caliphate. There are plenty of elements that enable us to perceive the innermost aspect of such traditions. I have pointed out that in antiquity the notions of soul, of double or demon, and later on of fjords or inies, and finally of the goddess of death and the goddess of victory were often confused in the same one notion. So much so as to establish the notion of a deity who is simultaneously goddess of battles and a transcendental element of the human soul. This was the case, for instance, with the notions of Fogyá, Nordic tradition, and of the prophecy Iranian. The Fogyá, which literally means the escort, was conceived as a spiritual entity dwelling in every man. He may be perceived in special times, or instance at the time of death or of mortal danger. The Fogyá was confused with the Huger, the equivalent of the soul, but was also believed to be a supernatural power, namely, the spirit of both the individual and of his stock. 
but the Fogo is often portrayed as the equivalent of the Valkyrie, who in turn was conceived as an entity of fate leading the individual to victory and to a heroic death. The same was true for the Fravashi of the ancient Iranian tradition, the terrifying goddesses of war who give victory, health, and good glory to those who invoke them, while appearing as inner power in every being that maintains it and makes it grow and subsist and as the everlasting and deified souls of the dead in relation to the mystical power of the stock, as in the Hindu Peter and in the Latin names. I have already discussed this kind of life-life, or deep-seated power of life hidden behind the body in the state of finite consciousness. Here it will suffice to say that one's guiding principle, demon, or double transcends every personal and particular form in which it is manifested. Thus, the abrupt and sudden shift from the ordinary state of individuated consciousness to the state characterized by such a principle would usually have the meaning of a destructive crisis, which effectively takes place after death. If we conceive that in some special circumstances the double may burst into one's conscious high and manifest itself according to its destructive transcendence, the meaning of the first of the above-mentioned assimilations will become apparent, hence the double, or man's guiding principle, and the deity of death that manifests itself, e.g. as a Valkyrie, at the moment of death or in circumstances of mortal danger, become one and the same. In the asceticism of religious and mystical type, self-mortification, renunciation of oneself, and devotion to God are the preferred means that are employed to induce and to overcome the above-mentioned crisis. According to the other path to transcendence, however, the means to induce this crisis consist in the act of exalted awakening of the element of action in a pure state. At an inferior level dance was used as a sacred method to attract and to manifest various divinities and invisible powers through the ecstasy of the soul. This was the odd, shamanistic, bacchic, monodic, and corbantic theme. In ancient Rome to there were sacred priestly dances performed by the Luperci and by the Arvoli. The words of the Arvoli symbol help us, O Mars, dance. Dance already show the relationship between dance and war, which was sacred to Mars. Another life, unleashed by the rhythm, was grafted onto the life of the dancer, representing the emergence of the abyssal root of the previous life dramatized by the Laureus Lola Dentes or Security by the Fiores, by the Irenes, and by the wild spiritual entities that have attributed similar to Zygros. Great Anturu destroys everything on his path. These were manifestations of the guiding principle in its fearful and active transcendence. At a higher level there were the games as mare, namely, as sacred games and war. In the clear-minded Inebra Indian, in the heroic Alon generated in the struggle and in the tension for victory, in the games, but especially in war, tradition recognized the opportunity to undergo an analogous experience. It appears that even Edmolon, Luder conveyed the idea of untying, which esoterically referred to the ability usually found in competition to untie the individual bond and to reveal deep-seated powers. Hints of further assimilation through which the guiding principle and the goddess of death not only are identical to the Führers and to the Irenes, but to the goddesses of war known as the Valkyrie, virgin warriors who magically strike the enemy with a frantic panic, and to the Frav who are terrible, omnipotent powers who attack impetuously. These powers were eventually transformed into goddesses such as Victory or Nike, into the Lar Victor, into the Lar Martis E.T. Pachis Trompaius, and into Le, who in Rome were considered as demigods who have founded the city and instituted the empire. This further transformation corresponds to the positive outcome of such experiences, just as the double signified the deep power at a latent state in relation to the external consciousness. Just as the goddess of death dramatized the sensation of the manifestation of this power as a principle of crisis for the essence of the empirical self, and just as the Fioras and the Irenius of the Lelodentes reflected a particular way for this power to become unleashed and to burst out, likewise, the goddess of Toria and the Lar Victor expressed the triumph over this power, the two merging into one, and the triumphant passage to the state that lies beyond the danger of the formless ecstasy and dissolution occurring at the precise frantic moment of action. Moreover, wherever the actions of the spirit take place within the body of real actions and events, unlike what takes place in the domain of contemplative asceticism, a real parallelism can be established between the physical and the metaphysical, the visible and the invisible. Therefore, those actions can appear as the occult counterpart of worry feats or of competitive events that have a real victory as their climax.
then the material victory reflects a corresponding spiritual event that has determined it alongside the previously disclosed paths of the entities connecting the inside to the outside. In other words, it appears as the real sign of an initiation and of a mystical epiphany taking place simultaneously. The war and the military leader who faced the fours and death in a real way, met them simultaneously within himself, in his spirit, under the form of dangerous manifestations of powers emerging from his abyssal nature. By triumphing over them, he achieved victory. This is why in classical traditions every victory often acquired a sacred meaning, and the emperor, in the hero, and in the leader was acclaimed victorious on the battlefield. Just as in the winter of the sacred loaded, it was possible to detect the abrupt manifestation of a mystical force that transformed him and made him more than a human being. One of the warrior customs practiced by the Romans, which is susceptible to an esoteric interpretation, was the act of carrying the victorious general on shields. Ennius, 239-169 BC, had previously assimilated the shield to the vault of heaven Altisinum Coloclopum, and the shield was sacred in the temple of the Olympian Jupiter. In the 3rd century, the title of emperor became one and the same with that of victor in the ceremony of triumph. More than a military parade was a sacred ceremony in honor of the supreme capital line god. The winner appeared as the living image of Jupiter and proceeded to put into the hands of this god the triumphal laurel of his victory. The triumphal chariot was the symbol of Jupiter's cosmic quadriga and the insignia of the leader corresponded to those of the god. The symbolism of victories, valkyries, or analogous entities leading the souls of the fallen heroes to the heavens, or the symbolism of a triumphant hero who, like Heracles, receives from Nike the crown reserved for those who partake of the Olympian immortality, becomes clear and completes what has been said so far about the holy war. We are in the context of traditions in which victory acquires the meaning of immortality similar to that bestowed in an initiation and in which victory appears as the mediatrix because of either her participation in transcendence or the manifestation of transcendence into a body of power. The Islamic idea according to which the war is slain in a holy war, jihad, have never really died should be referred to the same principle. Last but not least, the victory of a leader was often regarded by the Romans as a separate entity, Newman, the mysterious life of which constituted the focus of a special cult, feasts, sacred games, rituals, and sacrifices were destined to renew its presence. The Victoria Caesaris is the best example of this. Being the equivalent of an initiatory or sacrificial action, every victory was believed to generate an entity that was distinct from the destiny and from the particular individuality of the mortal being from which it derived. Just as in the case of the victory of the divine ancestors, this entity was believed to be capable of establishing a line of special spiritual influences. And as in the case of the cult of the divine ancestors, such influences needed to be confirmed and developed through roots acting in accord with the laws of sympathy and analogy. Therefore, it was mainly through games and competitions that the victorious Numina were periodically celebrated. The regularity of this competitive cult, which was decreed by a law, had the power to materialize a presence that was ready to join the forces of the race in an occult fashion and led them toward a good outcome in order to transform new victories into the means necessary for the revelation, and for the strengthening of the energy of the original victory. Thus, in Rome, once the celebration of the deceased Caesar was confused with that of his victory, and once regular games were dedicated to the Victoria Caesars, it became possible to see in him a perennial winner. The cult of victory, believed to predate history, may be considered, generally speaking, as the secret soul of the Roman greatness and fides. Since the times of Augustus, the statue of the goddess Victory had been placed on the altar of the Roman Senate. According to a traditional custom, any senator heading for his seat was expected first to approach that altar in order to burn some incense on it. That force was thus believed to preside invisibly over the deliberations of the courier. Hands were raised toward it when an oath of faithfulness was pronounced upon the advent of a new Caesar. And also on every January 3rd when solemn vows were made for the well-being of the emperor and for the prosperity of the empire. This was the most resilient Roman cult, and the last to fall under the onslaught of Christianity. No belief was more strongly upheld by the Romans than the belief that the divine powers were responsible for creating Rome's greatness and for supporting its itemitis and, consequently, that a war, before being won on the battlefields, had to be won or at least actuated in a mystical way. Following the defeat at Lake Trasimene, 217 BC, Phibius told his soldiers, Your fault consists in having neglected the sacrifices and in having ignored the declarations of the augurs rather than in having lacked courage or ability. It was also an article of faith that in order to take a city it was necessary first to cause a tutelary god to abandon it. 
No war was initiated without sacrifices. A special college of priests, Fedalis, was entrusted with the rites pertaining to war. The bottom line of the Roman art of war was not to be forced to fight if the gods were opposed to it. Themistocles said, the gods and heroes performed these deeds, not us. Again, the real focus of everything was the sev. Supernatural actions were invoked to assist human actions and to infuse in them the mystical power of victory. Since I have mentioned action and heroism as traditional values, it is expedient to underline the difference between them in the forms that, a few exceptions notwithstanding, can be seen in our day and age. The difference consists, once again, in the lack of the dimension of transcendence, and thus of an orientation that, even when it is not dictated by pure instinct and blind force, does not lead to a true opening but rather generates qualities that are destined to bestow on the empirical subject only a dark and tragic splendor. In the case of ascetical values we find an analogous alteration that deprives asceticism of every enlightening element as one goes from the notion of asceticism to that of ethics, especially in relation to mortal doctrines such as the Kantian and the Stoical ethical systems. Every morality, in its higher versions, such as Kant's autonomous morality, is nothing but secularized asceticism. As such, it is only a surviving stump and it lacks real foundation. Thus, the critique of the modern free spirits, Nietzsche included, could easily dismiss the values and the imperatives of the morality improperly designated as traditional improperly, because in a traditional civilization no morality enjoyed an autonomous dimension. Our contemporaries, however, have fallen to an even lower level in the shift that occurred from the autonomous and categorically imperative morality to a utilitarian and social morality affected by a fundamental relativity and contingency. As is the case with asceticism in general, when heroism and action are not aimed at leading back one's personality to its true center, they are nothing but an artificial device that begins and ends with man, as such they do not acquire a meaning or a value beyond that of sensation, exulta, and frantic impulsiveness. Such is, almost without exception, the case of the modern cult of action. Even when everything is not reduced to a cultivation of reflexes and to a control of elementary reactions, as in the case of war on the front line, considering the advanced degree of mechanization of the modern varieties of action, it is almost inevitable for man to seek out and to feed himself with existentially limited experiences wherever they are to be found. Moreover, the plane is often shifted to collective and subpersonal forces, the incarnation of which is furthered by the XC associated with heroism, sport, and action. The heroic myth based on individualism, voluntarism, and a superman attitude constitutes a dangerous deviation in our modern era. On its basis, the individual, including to himself all possibilities of extra individual and extra human development, assumes, by virtue of a diabolical construction, the principle of his insignificant physical will as an absolute reference point and assails the external phantasm by opposing to it the phantasm of his own self. It is ironic that when confronting this contaminating sanity, he who realizes what game these poor and more or less heroic individuals are playing recalls Confucius' advice according to which every reasonable person has the duty to safeguard his own life in view of the development of the only possibilities by virtue of which a man truly deserves to be called a man. The fact remains that modern man needs these degraded and desecrated forms of action as if they were some kind of drug. He needs them to elude the sense of his inner emptiness, to be aware of himself, and to find in exasperated sensations the surrogate for the true meaning of life. One of the characteristics of the Western Dark Age, Kali Yuga, is a sort of titanic restlessness that knows no limitations and that induces an existential fever and awakens new sources of elation and of stupefaction. Before continuing, I need to mention an aspect of the traditional spirit that is related to the law and to the views expounded so far. I am talking about various ordeals of character and so-called divine judgments. What often the test of truth, right, justice, and innocence was made to depend on a trial that consisted of a decisive action, experimentum crucis. Just as the law was traditionally believed to have a divine origin, likewise injustice was considered to be a violation of the divine law and to be detectable through the outcome of a human action that had been given an adequate orientation. A Germanic custom consisted of delving into the divine will through the test of arms as a particular form of oracle mediated by action. The idea that originally was at the basis of the custom of challenging somebody to a duel is not very different. Starting with the principle, the equal ist fortidata, this principle was eventually extended to feuding states and nations. 
a battle as late as that of Fontini, a D841, was conceived as a divine judgment that was invoked to establish the rights of two brothers both claiming the legacy of Charlemagne. When a battle was fought in this spirit, it followed special rules. The winner was forbidden to lead and to exploit strategically and territorially successful outcome, and both sides were expected to tend equally to the fallen and to the wounded. According to the general view that was preserved through the entire Carolingian period, however, even when the idea of a specific proof was not required, victory and defeat were felt to be signs from above establishing justice or injustice, truth or guilt. In the legend of the combat between Roland and Fregus and in analogous themes of chivalrous literature, we can see that during the Middle Ages people believed that the test of arms was the criterion capable of assessing the true faith. In other instances, the trial consisted in the induction of a paranormal phenomenon. This was the case of classical antiquity too. According to a Roman tradition, a vessel virgin suspected of sacrilege demonstrated her own innocence by carrying water from the Tiber River in a sieve. There was also the custom, which is not confined to the degenerative forms that have survived among savage populations, of challenging a suspect who claimed his or her own innocence to ingest a poison or a substance induced in vomit. If the substance induced the usual effects, the charge was validated. During the Middle Ages, analogous voluntary ordeals were found not only in the context of temporal justice, but in the sacred domain too. Monks and even bishops agreed to submit themselves to such a criterion in order to establish the truth of their claims in matters of doctrine. Even torture, which was conceived as a means to interrogate prisoners, was originally related to the notion of divine judgment. Truth was believed to have an almost magical power. It was a common belief that no torture could undermine the inner truth of an innocent person and of somebody who was telling the truth. There is a clear connection between all this and the mystical character traditionally associated with victory. In these trials, including this trial of arms, God was called as a witness by the participants in order for them to receive from him a supernatural sign that would then be used as a judgment. It is possible to rise from the lower level of these naive theistic representations to the pure form of the traditional idea, according to which truth, law, and justice ultimately appear as the manifestations of a metaphysical order conceived as a reality that the state of truth and of justice in man has the power to evoke in an objective way. In antiquity the overworld was conceived of as a reality in the higher sense of the word, superior to the laws of nature and capable of manifesting itself in this world every time one opened oneself to it without reservations in concern for oneself. In the next stage the individual entered into certain psychic states, the already mentioned heroic, competitive state that unties the extreme tension of the ordeal and of the danger being faced, that were destined to open the closed human circuits to wider circuits, and through which it was possible to generate unusual and apparently miraculous effects. This view explains and gives the proper meaning to traditions and customs such as the above-mentioned ones. In the order of these customs, truth and reality, might and law, victory and justice formed one thing having the supernatural as their center of gravity. These views were destined to be regarded as pure superstition wherever progress systematically deprived the human virtues of any possibility of establishing an objective contact with the superior order of things. Once man's strength was thought to be on the same level as that of animals, that is, as the faculty of mechanical action in a being who is not at all connected to what transcends him as an individual, the trial of strength obviously becomes meaningless and the outcome of every competition becomes entirely contingent and lacking in potential relation with an order of higher values. Once the ideas of truth, law, and justice were turned into abstractions or social conventions, once the sensation, thanks to which in Aryan India it was possible to say, the earth as truth as its foundation, was forgotten, once every perception of these values as objective and almost physical apparitions of the supernatural amid the network of contingencies was lost, then it is natural to wonder how truth, law, and justice could possibly influence the determination of the phenomenon facts that science, until recently, has decreed not to be susceptible to modification. Nowadays, decisions with regard to what is true or right as well as matters of innocence and guilt are left to the clamor of petty fobbers, the laborious promulgation of legal documents, the lengthy paragraphs of laws that are equal for everybody and made omnipotent by the secular estates and the plebeian masses who rule themselves without kings and self-appointed rulers.
Conversely, the proud self-assurance with which traditional man reacted valiantly and super-individually against the enemy, armed with faith in the sword, and the spiritual impassibility that placed him in an a priori, absolute relation to a supernatural power not subject to the power of the elements, sensations, and natural laws, all these things have come to be considered mere superstitions. In this context, too, the decline of traditional values has been followed by their inversion, an inversion that can be seen at work wherever the modern world makes a profession of realism and seems to take up again the idea of an identity of victory and law with the principle, might is right. Since this is might in the highest material sense of the word, or better, if we refer to war in its most recent forms, in an almost demonic sense, since the technical and industrial potential has become the most decisive factor, then we can see that discussions about values and righteousness are merely rhetorical. Such rhetoric is employed through big words and a hypocritical diploma of principles as a means in the service of an ugly will to power. This is a particular upheaval characterizing the last times, more on which later. Chapter 19 Space, Time, the Earth I have previously pointed out that the difference between traditional and modern man is not simply a matter of mentality and type of civilization. Rather, the difference concerns the experiential possibilities available to each and the way in which the world of nature is experienced according to the categories of perception and the fundamental relationship between I and I. For traditional man, space, time, and causality had a very different character than they have in the experience of modern man. The mistake of epistemology from Kant on is to assume that these fundamental forms of human experience have always remained the same, especially those with which we are most familiar in recent times. On the contrary, even in this aspect it is possible to notice a deep transformation that reflects the general evolutive process at work in history. With this said, I will limit myself to discussing the difference in the perception of space and time. As I mentioned in the foreword, my main contention is that time in traditional civilizations was not a linear, historical time. Time and becoming are related to what is superior to time. In this way the perception of time undergoes a spiritual transformation. In order to clarify this point it is necessary to explain what time means today. Time is perceived as the simple irreversible order of consecutive events. Its parts are mutually homogeneous and therefore can be measured in a quantitative fashion. Moreover, a distinction is made between before and later, namely, between past and future, in reference to a totally relative, the present, point in time. But whether an event is past or future, whether it takes place in one or another point in time, does not confer upon it any special quality, it merely makes it a day event, that's all. In other words, there is some kind of reciprocal indifference between time and its contents. The temporality of these contents simply means that they are carried along by a continuous current that never inverts its course and in which every moment, while being different from all others, is also equal to all others. In the most recent scientific theories, such as Minkowski's and Einstein's, time even loses this particular character. Scientists talk about the relativity of time, of time as spaces, worth a mention and so on. This means that time becomes a mathematical order per se that is absolutely indifferent with regard to events, which may thus be located in a before rather than in an after, depending on the reference system being adopted. The traditional experience of time was of a very different kind. Time was not regarded quantitatively but rather qualitatively, not as a series but as rhythm. It did not flow uniformly and indefinitely but was broken down into cycles and periods in which every moment had its own meaning and specific value in relation to all others, as well as a lively individuality and functionality. Each of these cycles or periods, the Chaldean and Hellenic Great Year, the Etruscan or Latin Cyclum, the Iranian Aeon, the Aztec Suns, the Hindu Kalpas, represented a complete development forming closed and perfect units that were identical to each other. Although they reoccurred, they did not change nor did they multiply but rather followed each other, according to Hubert Moss' fitting expression, as a series of eternities. Since this wholeness was not quantitative but organic, the chronological duration of the cyclone was ephemeral. Quantitatively different periods of time were regarded as equal, provided that each of them contained and reproduced all the typical phases of a cycle. And so, certain numbers such as 7, 9, 12, and 1000 were traditionally employed not to express quantities, but rather typical structures of rhythm. Thus they had different durations though they remained symbolically equivalent. Accordingly, instead of an indefinite chronological sequence, the traditional world knew a hierarchy based on illogical correspondences between great and small cycles. The result was a sort of reduction of the temporal manifolds to superpolar unity.
since the small cycle reproduced analogically the great cycle. This created the possibility of participation in ever greater orders and in durations increasingly free from all residues of matter or contingency, until what was reached was some kind of space-time continuum. By ordering time from above so that every duration was divided into several cyclical periods reflecting such a structure, and by associating to specific moments of these cycles the celebrations, rituals, or festivities that were destined to reawaken or to reveal a corresponding meanings, the traditional world actively promoted a liberation and a transfigura. It arrested the confused flow of the waters and created in them a transparency in the current of becoming, thus revealing immobile metaphysical depths. Therefore, it should not come as a surprise that the base calendar that measured time in ancient times had a sacred character and that it was entrusted to the wisdom of the priestly caste and that the hours of the day, the days of the week, and given days of the year were considered sacred to certain deities or associated with specific destinies. After all, as a residue of this notion, Catholicism developed a liturgical year spangled with religious festivities and with days marked by sacred events. In this liturgical year we can still find an echo of that ancient view of time that was measured by ritual, transfigured by the symbol, and shaped into the image of a sacred history. The fact that stars, stellar periods, and given points in the course of the sun were traditionally utilized to determine the units of rhythm hardly lends support to the so-called naturalistic interpretations of time. In fact, the traditional world never deified the natural or heavenly elements, but on the contrary, these elements were thought fit to convey divine forces in an analogical fashion. There is in the heavens a great multitude of gods who have been recognized as such by those who survey the heavens not casually, nor like cattle. Therefore, we can assume that the position of the sun in the course of the year was primordially the center and the beginning of an organic system, of which the calendar notation was just another aspect, that established constant indifi and symbolic and magical correspondences between man, Kalmzos, and supernatural reality. The two arches of the ascent and the descent of the solar light during the year appear to be the most apt to express the sacrificial meaning of death and rebirth, as well as the cycle constituted by the dark descending path and by the bright ascending path. I will discuss later the tradition according to which the area that today corresponds to the Arctic regions was the original homeland of the stocks that created the main Indo-European civilizations. It is possible that when the Arctic freeze occurred, the division of the year into one long night and one long day highly dramatized the perception of the sun's journey in the sky, and thus made it one of the best ways to express the above-mentioned metaphysical meanings, substituting them with what was referred to in more remote periods as a peer though not yet solar, polar symbolism, considering that the constellations of the zodiac, which were articulations of the god year, were used to identify the moments of the sun's position in the sky, the number 12 is repeatedly found as one of the most apt rhythms to express anything that may have the meaning of a solar fulfillment. This number is also found wherever a center was established that in one way or another embodied or attempted to embody the Iranian solar tradition or wherever myths or legends have portrayed the type of an analogous region see through figurations or symbolic personifications. But in the course of the solar journey along the twelve points of the zodiac, one point in particular acquires a special meaning, and that is the critical one corresponding to the lowest point on the ellipsis, winter solstice, which marks the end of the descent, the beginning of the recent, and the separation of the dark and the bright periods. According to figurations formulated in remote prehistory, the god year is portrayed in this context as the axe or as the god axe who splits in half the circular symbol of the year or other equivalent symbols. From a spiritual perspective, this marks the typically triumphant moment of solarity and the beginning of a new life and of a new cycle. This moment was represented in various myths as the victorious outcome of the struggle of a solar hero against creatures manifest in the Dark Principle. These creatures were often represented by the sign of the zodiac in which the winter solstice happened to fall in that particular year. The dates corresponding to stellar positions in the sky, such as the solstice, which were apt to express higher meanings in terms of a cosmic symbolism, are preserved almost identically in the various forms assumed by tradition and passed on from one people to another. Through a comparative study it is possible and very easy to point out the correspondence and the uniformity of feasts and of fundamental calendar rhythms through which the sacred was introduced into the fabric of time thus breaking its duration into many cyclical images of an eternal history that various natural phenomena contributed to recall and to mark the rhythm. In the traditional view, moreover, time presented a magical aspect. 
Since by virtue of the law of analogical correspondences, every point of a cycle had its own individuality, duration consisted in the periodical succession of manifestations typical of certain influences and powers, it presented times that were favorable and unfavorable, auspicious and inauspicious. This qualitative element of time played the main role in the science of the right. The parts of time could not be considered indifferent to the things to be performed and thus presented an active character that had to be reckoned with. Every rite had its own appointed time. It had to be performed at a particular moment, outside of which its virtue was diminished or paralyzed, and could even produce the opposite effect. In many ways we can agree with Hubert Moss, who said that the ancient calendar marked the P of a system of rites. More generally, there were disciplines, such as the science of divination, that attempted to establish whether a given time or period was auspicious or not for the performance of a given deed. I have already mentioned the attention given to this matter in Roman military enterprises. This is not fatalism. It rather expresses traditional man's constant intent to prolong and integrate his own strength with a non-human strength by discovering the times in which to rhythms, the human rhythm in the rhythm of natural powers, by virtue of a law of Cindy, of a concordant action and of a certain correspondence between the physical and the metaphysical dimensions, are liable to become one thing, and thus cause invisible powers to act. In this way, the qualitative view of time is confirmed. Within time, every hour and every aspect has its sacred aspect and its virtue, also, acting within time on the higher, symbolica, and sacred plane there are cyclical laws that actualize in an identical fashion an uninterrupted chain of eternity. The considerations that follow from these premises are very important. If traditionally, empirical time was measured by a transcendent time that did not contain events but meanings, and if this essentially metahistorical time must be considered as the context in which missed heroes, and traditional gods lived in, acted, then an opposite shift acting, from below must also be conceived. In other words, it is possible that some historically real events or people may have repeated and dramatized a myth, incarnating metahistorical structures and symbols whether in part or entirely, whether consciously or unconsciously. Thereupon, by virtue of this, these events are being shifted from one time to the other, becoming new expressions of pre-existing realities. They belong to both times. They are characters and events that are simultaneously real and symbolica, and on this basis they can be transported from one period to another, before or after their real existence, as long as one is aware of the metahistorical element they represent. This is the reason why some of the findings of modern scholars concerning the alleged historicity of events or characters of the traditional world, much of their obsession to separate what is historical from what is mythical or legendary, some of their doubts about the childish traditional chronology, and finally their belief in so-called humorism, can most decisively be said to lack solid foundations. In these cases, as I have previously argued, myth and anti-history represent the path leading to a deeper knowledge of what we regard as history. Moreover, it is in the same order of ideas that we must look for the true meaning of the legends concerning characters who became invisible, who have never died, and who are destined to do awakened or to manifest themselves at the end of a given time cyclical correspondence, such as Alexander the Great, King Arthur, Frederick, King Sebastian. The latter are all different incarnations of the same one theme transferred from reality into superreality. The Hindu doctrine of the avatars, the periodical divine incarnations who assume different personalities but who nevertheless express the same function, must be interpreted along these lines. If traditional man had an experience of time essentially different from that of modern man, it follows that analogous considerations must be made concerning the experience of space, Space is considered today as the simple container of bodies and of motions, totally indifferent to both. It is homogeneous, a particular area of it is the objective equivalent of another one, and the fact that a thing is found, or that an event may take place, in one point of space rather than in another, does not confer any particular quality to the intimate nature of that thing or of that event. I am referring here to what space represents in the immediate experience of modern man and not to certain recent physical mathematical views of space as a curved and non-homogeneous, multitous space. Moreover, beside the fact that these are mere mathematical schemata, the value of which is merely pragmatic and without correspondence to any real experience, the different values that the points of each of these spaces represent when considered as intensive fields are referred only to matter, energy, and gravitation and not to something extra-physical or qualitative. 
In the experience of traditional man, on the contrary, and even in its residues, at times present among some savage populations, space is alive and saturated with all kinds of qualities and intensity. The traditional idea of space is often confused with the same idea of idle ether, the axa or mana, which is a mystical, all-pervasive substance energy, more material than immaterial, more psychic than physical, often conceived as light, and distributed according to various saturations in various regions. Thus, each of these regions seems to possess its own virtues and to participate essentially in the powers that reside in it so as to make every place a fatidic space endowed with its own intensity and occult individuality. In the well-known expression of Epimenides of Gnosis, 6th century BC, that was quoted by Paul in his speech in the Areopagus, and in we live and move and have our being, Acts 1728, if we substitute for the word him the word divine or sacred or numinous, it may be employed to express what traditional man often saw instead of the space of the moderns, which is ultimately an abstract and impersonal place filled with objects and motions. It is not possible in this context to discuss all of what in the traditional world was based on such an experience of space. I will limit myself to references in the two distinct orders mentioned above, namely, the magical and the symbolicate. Space and antiquity has constantly provided the basis for the most characteristic expressions of the metaphysical dimension. The heavily in the earthly regions, high and low, the vertical and horizontal axis, left and right, were all categories that provided the material for a typical, highly significant, and universal symbolism, one of the most famous forms of which was the symbolism of the cross. There may well have been a relationship between the two-dimensional cross and the four cardinal points. Between the three-dimensional cross and the schema derived by adding to these points the dimensions of above and below, still this does not lend any support whatsoever to the naturalistic and geoastronomical interpretations of ancient symbols. At this point it is helpful to repeat what has been said concerning the astral element of the calendars, namely, that when the cross is found in nature this means that true symbolism, far from being artificially devised by man, is found in nature itself. Or better, nature in its entirety is nothing but a symbol of transcendent realities. When we shift to the magical plane, every direction in space corresponded to given influences that were often portrayed as supernatural beings or spirits. This knowledge not only helped to establish important aspects of the archal science and of geomancy, see the characteristic development of this discipline in the Far East, but also the doctrine of the sacred orientations in the rite and the arrangement of the temples, the art of orientation of the cathedrals was preserved in Europe up to the Middle Ages, always in conformity with the law of analogies and with the possibility, afforded by this law, to extend the human and the visible element into the cosmic and invisible dimension. Just as one moment of traditional time did not correspond to another because of the action, especially a ritual one, that had to be undertaken, likewise there was not a point, a region, or a place of traditional space that corresponded to another. This was the case in an even wider sense owing to the fact that some rites required subterranean places or caves, while others required mountain peaks, and so on. In fact, there was such a thing as a real, that is, not arbitrary, but conform to physical transpositions of metaphysical elements, sacred geography that inspired the belief in sacred lands and cities, and the traditional centers of spiritual influence on earth, and also in environments consecrated so as to vitalize any action oriented to the transcendence taking place within them. Generally speaking, in the world of tradition the location of the temples and of many cities was not casual, nor did it obey simple criteria of convenience, their construction was preceded by specific rites and obeyed special laws of rhythm and of analogy. It is very easy to identify those elements that indicate that the space in which the traditional rite took place was not space as modern man understands it but rather a living, fated, magnetic space in which every gesture had a meaning and in which every sign, word, and action participated in a sense of inoctability and of eternity, thus becoming transformed into a kind of decree of the invisible, and yet the space in which the rite occurs should be regarded as a more intense kind of space in the general perception of the man of tradition. I will now briefly discuss the myths with which, according to our contemporaries, ancient man embellished the various elements and aspects of nature. The truth is that here we find once more that opposition between hyperrealism and humanism that separates what is traditional from what is modern. The experience of nature, as it is understood by modern man, namely, as a lyrical, subjectivist pathos awoken in the sentiments of the individual at the sight of nature, was almost entirely absent in traditional man. 
Before the high and snowy peaks, the silence of the woods, the flowing of the rivers, mysterious caves, and so on, traditional man did not have poetic and subjective impressions typical of a romantic soul, but rather real sensations, even though at times confused, of the supernatural, the powers, numine, that permeated those places. These sensations were translated into various images, spirits and gods of the elements, waterfalls, woods, and so on, often determined by the imagination, yet not arbitrarily and subbed, but according to a necessary process. In other words, we may assume that in traditional man the power of the imagination was not merely confined to either the material images corresponding to sensible data or arbitrary and subjective images, as in the case of the reveries or dreams of modern man. On the contrary, we may conclude that in traditional man the power of the imagination was free, to a high degree, from the yoke of the physical senses, as it is now it is in the state of sleep or through the use of drugs. This power was so disposed as to be able to perceive and translate into plastic forms subtler impressions of the environment, which nonetheless were not arbitrary and subjective. When in the state of dream a physical impression, such as the pressure of the blankets, is dramatized with the image of a falling rock, this is obviously the case of a fantastic and yet not arbitrary production. The image arose out of necessity, independently from the eye, as a symbol that effectively corresponds to a perception. The same holds true for those fantastic images primordial man introduced in nature. Primordial man, in addition to physical perception, also had a psychic or subtle perception of things and places corresponding to the presences found in them that was generated by a power of the imagination free from the physical senses and responsible for determining in it corresponding symbolic dramatizations. For example, gods, demons, elementals, and spirits ruling over places and phenomena. It is true that there have often been different personifications according to the multiform power of the imagination of various races and sometimes even of different people. But a trained eye is able to see unity behind this variety, just as a person who is awake is immediately able to see unity in the variety of impressions created by the diversity of symbols in the dreams of different people. These images are nevertheless equivalent once they are reduced to their common objective cause and perceived in a distinct way. Far from being fantastic poetical tales drawn from nature, or better, from those material representations of nature that modern man can perceive, the myths of the ancients and their fantastic fundamental figurations originally represented an integration of the objective experience of nature. The myths also represented something that spontaneously penetrated into the fabric of sensible data, thus completing them with lively and at times even visible symbols of the subtle, demonic, or sacred element of space and time. These considerations concerning the traditional myths and the special relation they have with the sense of nature must naturally be applied to every traditional myth. It must be acknowledged that every traditional mythology arises as a necessary process in the individual consciousness, the origin of which resides in real, though unconscious and obscure, relationships with the higher reality. These relationships are then dramatized in various ways by the power of the imagination. Therefore, not only naturalistic or theological myths but historical ones as well should not be regarded as arbitrary inventions totally devoid of an objective value with regard to facts or people, but rather as integrations that did not occur casually. These integrations eventually revealed the super-historical content that may be found to varying degrees in those historical individuals and events. Therefore, the eventual lack of correspondence of the historical element with the myth demonstrates the untruth of history rather than that of the myth. This thought occurred to Hegel, too, when he spoke about the impotence of nature. What has been said so far relates to the presence of some kind of existential situation concerning the basic relationship between the eye and the non-eye. This relationship has lately been characterized by a set and rigid separation. It so appears that in the origins, the borders between eye and non-eye were potentially fluid and unstable, and in certain cases they could partially be removed. When that happened, Either one of two possibilities could occur, the possibility of incursions of the not-eye, of its nature in the sense of its elemental forces and its psychism, into the eye, or an incursion of the eye into the not-eye. The first possibility explains what have been called the perils of the soul. It is the idea that the unity and the autonomy of the person may be threatened and affected by processes of possession and of abession. Hence the existence of rituals in various institutions that have as their goal the spiritual defense of the individual or of the collectivity and the confirmation of the independence and the sovereignty of the eye and of its structures.
The general presupposition for the efficacy of a body of magical procedures was that the second possibility, which consists of the removal of the boundaries and of the ensuing incursions in the opposite direction, of the I into the not I, could take place. Since the two possibilities shared the same basis, the advantages of the latter had as a counterpart the existential risk derived from the former. We should remember that during the last times, following the progress of materialization of the I, both possibilities have disappeared. The active and positive, magic, possibility has disappeared everywhere but in few insignificant and marginal residues. As far as the perils of the soul are concerned, modern man, who boasts to have finally become free and enlightened, and who laughs at everything that in traditional antiquity derived from that different relationship between I and not I, is really deceiving himself to think he is safe from them. Those dangers have only assumed a different form, which disguises them. Modern man is open to the complexes of the collective unconscious, to emotive and irrational currents, to collective influences, and to ideologies with consequences far more harmful and deplorable than those found in other eras and deriving from different influences. Returning to what I've expounded before, I would like to say something about the ancient meaning of the earth and of its properties. From a traditional point of view, between man and his land, between blood and soil, there existed an intimate relationship of a living and psychic character. Since a given area had a psychic individuality in addition to its geographic individuality, those who were born in it were bound to be deeply affected by it. From a doctrinal point of view, we must distinguish a double aspect in this state of dependency, the former naturalistic, the latter supernaturalistic, which leads us back to the above-mentioned distinction between totemism and the tradition of a patrician blood that must be purified by an element from above. The former aspect concerns beings who do not go beyond empirical and ordinary life. In these beings, the collective predominates, both as a law of blood and stock and as law of the soil. Even if the mystical sense of the region to which they belong is awakened, such a sense does not go beyond mere tellerism. Though they may know a tradition of rites, these rites have only a demonic and totemic character and they contribute to strengthening and renewing rather than overcoming and removing. The law of a virtue of which the individual does not have a life of his own and is thus destined to be dissolved into the subpersonal stock of his blood. So stage may be characterized by an almost communist and at times even matriarchal social organization of the clan or of the tribe. What we find in it, however, is what in modern man has either become extinguished or has become nationalistic or romantic rhetoric, namely, the organic and living sense of one's own land, which is a direct derivation of the qualitative experience of space in general. The second aspect of the traditional relationship between a man and his land is very different. Here we find the idea of a supernatural action that has permeated a given territory with the supernatural influence by removing the demonic telluric element of the soil and by imposing upon it a triumphal seal, thus reducing it to a mere substratum for the powers that transcend it. We have already found this idea in the ancient Iranian belief that the glory, the celestial, living, and triumphal fire that is the exclusive legacy of kings, pervades the lands that the Aryan race has conquered and that it possesses and defends against the infidels and the forces working for the god of darkness. After all, even in more recent times, there has been an intimate and not merely empirical relationship between spear and plow, between nobility and the farmers. It is significant that Aryan deities such as Mars or Don or Thor are simultaneously deities of war and of victory over elemental natures in the case of Thor, and of the soil presiding over its cultivation. I have already mentioned the symbolica and even initiatory transpositions that surrounded the cultivate and the memory of it that remains in the derivation of the word culture. Another characteristic expression lies in the fact that in every higher form of tradition, private ownership of the land as private property was an aristocratic and sacred privilege. The only people who could lay claim to the land were those who had rights in the specific patrician sense I mentioned in chapter 6, namely, those who are the living bearers of a divine element, in whom this right belonged only to the Pytress, the lords of the sacrificial fire. In Egypt it belonged only to the warriors and the priest, the slaves, those without family names and tradition were not thought to be qualified to own land because of their social status. For instance, in the ancient now Aztec civilization, two distinct and even opposite types of property coexisted. One was an aristocratic, hereditary, and differentiated type that was transmitted together with one's family social status. The second was popular and plebeian, of a promiscuous type, like the Russian mir. This opposition can be found in several other civilizations and is related to that which existed between the Iranian and Thon cults. In traditional nobility, a mysterious relationship was established between the gods or the heroes of a particular gens and that very land. 
It was through its new minute and with a net accentuation of the meaning, originally not only material, of ownership and lordship that the gens was connected to its own land, so much so that, due to a symbolic and possibly magical transposition, its limits, the Greek was in the Roman heraldom were regarded as sacred, fatal, and protected by gods of order such as Zeus and Jupiter. These are almost the equivalent, on another plane, of the same inner limits of the noble caste and of the noble family, we can say that this level limits of the land, just like the spiritual limits of the caste, were not limits that enslaved but that preserved and freed. We can understand why exile was often regarded as a punishment of a seriousness hardly understood today. It was almost like dying to the gens to whom one belonged. The same order of ideas is confirmed in the fact that in several traditional civilizations, to settle in a new, unknown, or wild land and to take possession of it was regarded as an act of creation and as an image of the primordial act whereby chaos was transformed into cosmos. In other words, it was not regarded as a mere human deed, but rather as an almost magical and ritual action believed to bestow on a land and on a physical location a form by bathing such land in the sacred and by making it living and real in a higher sense. Thus, there are examples of the ritual of taking possession of lands and of territorial conquest, as in the case of the land in Omen ancient Iceland or in the Aryan celebration of a territory through the establishment in it of an altar with fire. In China, the assignment of a fief, which turned a patrician into a prince, implied, among other things, the duty to maintain a sacrificial ritual for one's divine ancestors, who thus became the protectors of the territory, and for the god of this piece of land, who was created for the benefit of the prince himself. Moreover, if in the ancient Aryan law the firstborn was entitled to inherit the father's property and lands, often with the bond of inalienability, the property belonged to him essentially because he was regarded as the one who perpetuated the ritual of the family as the pontifex and the basilis of his own people, and as the one whose responsibility it was to tend the sacred fire and not let it be put out, since the fire was considered the body or life of the divine ancestor. We must also consider that the legacy of the right and that of the earth formed one whole, filled with meaning. Yedl, the monoma free northern Aryan men, in which the ideas of possession of the land, nobility, warrior blood, and divine cult were aspects of an unbreakable synthesis, was an example of this. In inheriting the ancestral land, there existed an unspoken and expressed commitment toward it, almost as a counterpart of the duty toward the divine and aristocratic legacy that was passed on through the blood and that alone had originally introduced the right to property. The last traces of these values can be found in the feudal Middle Ages. Even though during this time the right to property no longer belonged to the type of the aristocrat of sacred origins who was surrounded only by equals or rhymphi, as in the traditional forms of the origins found in the oldest constitution of the German people, and even though an aristocratic warrior class came to own the right to the land, nevertheless, the counterpart of such a right was the capability of a super-individual, though not sacred, dedication. The assignment of a fief implied, from the Franks on, the commitment on the part of the feudal lord to be faithful to his prince, that is, to exercise that fides that had a heroic and religious as well as a political and military value, sacramentum fidelitatis. This fides represented readiness to die and to sacrifice and, in connection to a superior order, an immediated way rather than immediately. As in the case of sacred aristocracy, sometimes without a metaphysical insight, although always with the virile superiority over the naturalistic and individualistic element and with the well-developed ethics of honor. Thus, those who are prone to consider not only the contingent and historical element, but also the meaning that social institutions assume on a higher plane, may detect in the feudal regimes of the Middle Ages traces of the traditional idea of the aristocratic and sacred privilege of ownership of the land, the idea according to which to own and be lord of a land, the inalienable right of superior stocks, is a spiritual and not merely a political title and commitment. Even the feudal interdependence between the state of the people and the state of the lands had a special meaning. Originally, the state of the people determined the state of the territorial property, depending on whether a man was more or less free, more or less powerful, the land he inhabited assumed either this or that character, which was validated by various titles of nobility. The state of the lands reflected therefore the state of the people. On this basis, the dependency that arose between the ideas of ownership and land became so intimate that later on the sign often appeared as a cause and the state of a people not only was indicated but determined by that of the land. Moreover, the social status and the various hierarchical and aristocratic dignities were incorporated in the soil.
Thus, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea expressed by calls according to which the apparition of the will, in the sense of an individualistic freedom, of those who own the land to divide their property, break it up, and separate it from the legacy of blood and the rigorous norms of the paternal right and primogeniture, truly represents one of the characteristic manifestations of the degeneration of the traditional spirit. More generally, when the right of property ceases to be the privilege of the two higher castes and shifts to the two lower castes, the merchants and the serfs, what de facto occurs is a virtual naturalistic regression, and therefore man's dependency on the spirits of the land is re-established. In the case of the sole traditionalism of the lords of the soil, superior presences transformed these spirits into zones of favorable influences and into a creative in preserving limits. The land, which may also belong to a merchant, the owners of the capitalist, Bourgeois may be regarded as the modern equivalent of the ancient merchant caste, or to a serf, our modern worker, is a desecrated land. In conformity with the interest typical of the two inferior castes, which have succeeded in taking the land away from the ancient type of feudal lords, the land is only valued from an economic point of view and it is exploited as much as possible with machines and with other modern technical devices. That being the case, it is natural to encounter other typical traits of a degeneration such as the property increasingly shift from the individual to the collectivity. Parallel with the collapse of the aristocratic title to the lands and the economy having become the main factor, what emerges first is nationalism, which is followed by socialism and finally by Marxist communism. In other words, there is a return to the rule of the collective over the individual that reaffirms the collectivist and promiscuous concept of property typical of inferior races as in overcoming of private property and his nationalization, socialization, and proletarization of goods and of lands. Chapter 20. Man and Woman To complete these considerations on traditional life, I will now briefly discuss the sexual dimension. In this context, we find that in the traditional worldview, realities corresponded to symbols and actions to rights. What derived from these correspondences are the principles for understanding the sexes and for regulating the relationships that are necessarily established between men and women in every normal civilization. In traditional symbolism, the supernatural principle was conceived as masculine in the principle of nature and of becoming as feminine. In Hellenic terms, the one Tuan, which is in itself complete and self-sufficient, is regarded as masculine. Conversely, the dyad, the principle of differentiation and of other than self, and thus the principle of desire and of movement, is regarded as feminine. In Hindu terms, according to the Samkhudar Sanda, the impassable spirit, Hirasha, is masculine, while property. The active matrix of every conditioned form is feminine. The Far Eastern tradition has expressed equivalent concepts through the cosmic duality of yin and yang, whereby yang, the male principle, is associated with the virtue of heaven and yin, the feminine principle, with the principle of the earth. Considered an end of themselves, the two principles are in opposition to each other. But in the order of the creative formation that I have repeatedly identified as the soul of the traditional world, and it was destined to develop historically in relation to the conflict between various races and civilizations. They are transformed into elements of a synthesis in which both retain a distinctive function. This is not the place to show that behind the various representations of the myth of the fall we often find the idea of the male principle's identification with and loss in the feminine principle until the former has acquired the latter's way of being. In any event, when this happens, when that which is naturally a self-subsistent principle succumbs to the law of that which does not have its own principle in itself by giving in to the forces of desire, then it is appropriate to talk about a fall. On the plane of human reality, the diffidence that various traditions have nurtured toward women is based precisely on this belief. The woman is often considered as a principle of sin, impurity, and evil, as well as a temptation and a danger for those who are in search of the supernatural. Nevertheless, it is possible to consider another possibility that runs counter to the direction of the fall, and that is to establish the correct relation between the two principles. This occurs when the feminine principle, whose force is centrifugal, does not turn to fleeting objects but rather to a, a virile stability in which she finds a limit to her restlessness. Stability is then transmitted to the feminine principle to the point of intimately transfiguring all of its possibilities. What occurs in these terms is a synthesis in a positive sense. What is needed, therefore, is a radical conversion of the feminine principle to the opposite principle. Moreover, it is absolutely necessary for the masculine principle to remain wholly itself. 
Then, according to metaphysical symbols, the female becomes the bride and also the power of instrumental generating force that receives the primordial principle of the immobile male's activity and form, as in the doctrine of Sakti, which can also be found in Ristadilandism and in Eplatonism, though expressed in different terms. I have mentioned the tantric Tibetan representations that are very significant in this regard, in which the male bearer of the scepter is immobile, cold, and substantiated with light while the substance of Sakti, which envelops it and uses it as its axis, is a flickering flame. These meanings constitute the foundation of the traditional teachings concerning the human sexes. This norm obeys the principle of the caste system and it also emphasizes the two cardinal tenets of Dharma and of Bhakti, or Fides self assistant nature and active dedication. If birth is not a matter of chance, then it is not a coincidence for a being to awaken to itself in the body of a man or woman. Here, too, the physical difference should be viewed as the equivalent of a spiritual difference. Hence, a being is a man or a woman in a physical way only because a being is either masculine or feminine in a transcendental way. Sexual differentiation, far from being an irrelevant factor in relation to the spirit, is the sign that points to a particular vocation and to a distinctive dana. We know that every traditional civilization is based on the will to order and give form, and that the traditional law is not oriented toward what is unqualified, equal, and indefinite, or in other words, toward that impersonal mix in which the various parts of the whole become promiscuously or atomically similar but rather intends these parts to be themselves and to express as perfectly as possible their own typical nature. Therefore, particularly with regard to the genders, man and woman are two different types. Those who are born as men must realize themselves as men, while those who are born as women must realize themselves as women, overcoming any mixture in promiscuity vocations. Even in regard to the supernatural vocation, man and woman must both have their own distinctive paths to follow, which cannot be altered without them turning into contradictory and inorganic ways of being. I have already considered the way of being that corresponds eminently to man. I have also discussed the two main paths of approach to the value of being a principle to oneself, namely, action and contemplation. Thus, the warrior, the hero, and the ascetic represent the two fundamental types of pure virility. In symmetry with these types, there are also two types available to the feminine nature. A woman realizes herself as such and even rises to the same level reached by a man as warrior and ascetic only as lover and mother. These are bipartitions of the same ideal strain. Just as there is an active heroism, there is also a passive heroism. There is a heroism of absolute affirmation and a heroism of absolute dedication. They can both be luminous and produce plenty of fruits, as far as overcoming human limitations and achieving liberation are concerned, when they are lived with purity and in the sense of an offering. This differentiation of the heroic strain determines the distinctive character of the paths of fulfillment available to men and women. In the case of women, the actions of the warrior and of the ascetic who affirm themselves in a life that is beyond life, the former through pure action and the latter through pure detachment, correspond to the act of the woman totally giving of herself and being entirely for another being, whether he is the loved one, the type of the lover, the aphrodisic woman, or the son, the type of the mother, the Dimitrian woman, finding in this dedication the meaning of her own life, her own joy, and her own justification. This is what Bhakti refines, which constitute the normal and natural way of participation of the traditional woman, really mean, both in the order of form and even beyond, form when it is lived in a radical and impersonal way. To realize oneself in an increasingly resolute way according to these two distinct and unmistakable directions. To reduce in a woman all that is masculine and in a man everything that is feminine and to strive to implement the archetypes of the absolute man and of the absolute woman. This was the traditional law concerning the sexes according to their different planes of existence. Therefore, a woman could traditionally participate in the sacred hierarchical order only in a mediated fashion, through her relationship with a man. In India, women did not have their own initiation even when they belonged to a higher caste. Before they got married, they did not belong to the sacred community of the Noble Ones, Ariel, other than through their fathers. And when they were married, through their husbands, who also represented the mystical head of the family. In Doric Hellas, the woman in her entire life did not enjoy any rights. Before getting married, her Creus was her father.
In Rome, in conformity with a similar spirituality, a woman, far from being equal to man, was juridically regarded as a daughter of her own husband, Philia Loco, and as a sister of her own children, Soros Loco. When she was a young girl, she was under the potestas of her father, who was the leader and the priest of his own gens. When she married, according to a rather blunt expression, she was in Monoerit. These traditional decrees regulating a woman's dependency can also be found in other civilizations, far from being unjust and arrogant. As the modern, free spirits are quick to decry, they help to define the limits and the natural place of the only spiritual path proper to the pure feminine nature. I will mention here some ancient views that expressly describe the pure type of the traditional woman, who is capable of an offering that is half human and half divine. In the Aztec Nahua tradition, the same privilege of heavenly immortality proper to the warrior aristocracy was positive by the mothers who died while giving birth, since the Aztecs considered the sacrifice on the same level as the one made by those who die in the battlefield. Another example is the type of the traditional Hindu woman, a woman who in the deepest recesses of her soul is capable of the most extreme forms of sensuality and yet who lived by an invisible and votive fides. By virtue of this fides, that offering that was manifested in the erotic dedication of her body, person, and will culminate it in another type of offering, of a different kind and way beyond the world of the senses. Because of this fides, the bride would leap into the funerary pyre in order to follow the man whom she had married into the next life. This traditional sacrifice, which was regarded as a sheer barbarism by Europeans and by westernized Hindus and in which the widow was burnt alive with the body of the dead husband, is called sati in Sanskrit, from the root as in the prefix sat being, from which the word sati, the truth, comes, sati also signifies gift, faithfulness, love, Therefore, this sacrifice was considered as the supreme culmination of the relationship between two beings of a different sex and as the sign of an absolute type of relationship, from the point of view of truth and superhumanity. In this context, man provides the role of the support for a liberating bhakti, and love becomes a door and a path of it. According to the traditional teaching, the woman who followed her husband in death attained heaven. She was transformed into the same substance as her deceased husband since he partook of that transfigure, which occurred through the incineration of the material body into a divine body of light, symbolized among Aryan civilizations by the ritual burning of the cadaver. We find an analogous renunciation of life on the part of Germanic women if their husbands or lovers died in battle. I have previously suggested that, generally speaking, the essence of bhakti consists of indifference toward the object or the means of an action, that is, in pure action and in a selfless attitude. This helps us understand how the ritual sacrifice of a widow, sati, could have been institutionalized in a traditional civilization such as the Hindu. Whenever a woman gives herself and even sacrifices herself only because of a stronger and reciprocated bond of human passion toward another being, her actions are still on the level of ordinary events. Only when her dedication can support and develop itself without any other external motivation whatsoever, does she truly participate in a transcendent dimension. In Islam, the institution of the harem was inspired by these motivations. In Christian Europe, it would take the idea of God for a woman to renounce her public life and to withdraw to a cloistered life. And even in this case, this was the choice of only a very few. In Islam, a man sufficed to provide such a motivation. The cloistered life of the harem was considered as a natural thing that no well-born woman would ever criticize or intend to avoid. It seemed natural for a woman to concentrate all her life on one man only, he was loved in such a vast and unselfish way as to allow other women to share in the same feeling and to be united to him through the same bond and the same dedication. What surfaces in all this is the character of purity, which is considered to be essential in this path. A love that sets conditions and requires the reciprocated love and the dedication of a man was reputed to be of an inferior kind. On the other hand, a real man could not know love in this way other than by becoming feminine, thus losing that inner self-sufficient thanks to which a woman finds in him a support and something that motivates and excites her desire to totally give herself to him. According to the myth Hiva, who was conceived as the great ascetic of the mountain peaks and Nakama, the god of love, into ashes with a single glance when the latter tried to awaken in him passion for his bride, Piety. Likewise, there is a profound meaning in the legend about the Kalkiyavar, which talks about a woman who could not be possessed by anybody because the men who desired her and fell in love with her turned into women as the result of their passion. As far as the woman is concerned, there is true greatness in her when she is capable of giving without asking for anything in return. 
when she is like a flame feeding itself, when she loves even more as the object of her love does not commit himself, does not open himself up, and even creates some distance, and finally, when the man is not perceived by her as a mere husband or lover, but as her lord. The spirit animating the harem consisted in the struggle to overcome jealousy and thus the passionate selfishness and the woman's natural inclination to possess the man. A woman was asked to commit herself to the harem from her adolescence to her old age and to be faithful to a man who could enjoy other women beside herself and possess them all without, giving himself to any one in particular. In this inhuman trait there was something ascetical and even sacred. In this apparent reification of woman, she experienced a true possession and overcoming, and even a liberation because vis a vis such an unconditional fides, a man, in his human appearance, was just a means to higher ends. Thus she discovered new possibilities to achieve higher goals. Just as the rule of the harem imitated the rule of the convents, likewise the Islamic law regulating a woman's life, according to the possibilities of her own nature, without excluding, but on the contrary, including and even exasperating the life of the senses, elevated her to the same plane of monastic asceticism. To a lesser degree, an analogous attitude in a woman should be considered the natural presupposition in those civilizations, such as Greece and Rome, in which the institution of concubinage enjoyed a sort of regular character and was legally acknowledged as a way to complement the monogamic marriage and in which sexual exclusivism was overcome. It goes without saying that I am not referring here to the harem or analogous institutions in mere materialistic terms. I have in mind what the harem meant to the pure traditional idea and the superior possibility inspiring these institutions. It is the task of tradition to create solid riverbeds, so that the chaotic currents of life may flow in the right direction. Free are those people who, upon undertaking this traditional direction, do not experience it as a burden but rather develop it naturally and recognize themselves in it so as to actualize through an inner along the highest and most traditional possibility of their own nature. The others, those who blindly follow the institutions and obey and live them without understanding them are not what we may call self-supported beings, although devoid of light. Their obedience virtually leads them beyond their limitations as individuals and ori them in the same direction followed by those who are free. But for those who follow neither the spirit nor the form of the traditional riverbed, there is nothing but chaos, they are the lost, the fallen ones. This is the case of our contemporaries as far as the woman is concerned. And yet it was not possible that a world that has overcome, to employ a Jacobin term, the caste system by returning to every human being his or her own dignity and rights could preserve some sense of the correct relationship between the two sexes. The emancipation of women was destined to follow that of the slaves and the glorification of people without a caste and without traditions, namely the pariah, in a society that no longer understands the figure of the ascetic and of the warrior in which the hands of the latest aristocrats seem better fit to hold tennis rackets or shakers for cocktail mixes than swords or scepters, in which the archetype of the virile man is represented by a boxer or by a movie star if not by the dull wimp represented by the intellectual, the college professor, the narcissistic puppet of the artist, or the busy and dirty money-making banker and the politician. In such a society, it was only a matter of time before women rose up and claimed for themselves a personality and a freedom according to the anarchist and individualist meaning usually associated with these words. And while traditional ethics asked men and women to be themselves to the utmost of their capabilities and express with radical traits their own gender-related characteristics, the new civilization aims at leveling everything since it is oriented to the formal sense to a stage that is truly not beyond but on this side of the individuation and differentiation of the sexes. What truly amounts to an abdication was thus claimed as a step forward. After centuries of slavery, women wanted to be themselves and to do whatever they pleased. But so-called feminism has not been able to devise a personality for women other than by imitating the male personality, so that the woman's claims conceal a fundamental lack of trust in herself as well as her inability to be and to function as a real woman and not as a man. Due to such a misunderstanding, the modern woman has considered her traditional role to be demeaning and has taken offense at being treated only as a woman. This was the beginning of a wrong vocation. Because of this, she wanted to take her revenge, reclaim her dignity, prove her true value, and compete with men in a man's world. But the man she set out to defeat is not at all a real man, only the puppet of a standardized, rationalized society that no longer knows anything that is truly differentiated and qualitative. 
In such a civilization there obviously cannot be any room for legitimate privileges, and thus women, who are unable and unwilling to recognize their natural traditional vocation and to defend it, even on the lowest possible plane, since no woman who is sexually fulfilled ever feels the need to imitate and to anti man, could easily demonstrate that they to virtually possess the same faculties and talents, both material and intellectual, that are found in the other sex and that, generally speaking, are required and cherished in a society of the modern type. And for his part has irresponsibly let this happen and has even helped and put women into the streets, offices, schools, and factories, and to all the polluted crossroads of modern culture and society. Thus, the last leveling push has been imparted. And wherever the spiritual, masculine, materialistic modern man did not tacitly restore the primacy, typically found in ancient Incaratic communities, of the woman as a terror, ruling over men enslaved by their senses and at her service, the results have been the degeneration of the feminine type even in her somatic characteristics, the atrophy of her natural possibilities, the suppression of her unique inner life. Hence the types of the woman garrison in the shallow and vain woman, incapable of any elan beyond herself, utterly inadequate as far as sensuality and sinfulness are concerned because to the modern woman the possibilities of physical love are often not as interesting as the narcissistic cult of her body, or as being seen with as many or as few clothes as possible, or as engaging in physical training, dancing, practicing sports, pursuing wealth, and so on, as it is, Europe knew very little about the purity of the offering and about the faithfulness of the one who gives her all without asking anything in return, or about a love strong enough so as not to be exclusivist. Besides a purely conformist and bourgeois faithfulness, the love Europe has celebrated is the love that does not tolerate the other person's lack of commitment. Now when a woman, before consecrating herself to a man, pretends that he belongs to her body and soul, not only has she already humanized and impoverished her offering, but worse yet, she has begun to betray the pure essence of femininity in order to borrow characteristics typical of the male nature, and possibly the lowest of these, the yearning to possess and lay claims over another person, and the pride of the ego. After that, everything else came tumbling down in a rush, following the law of acceleration. Eventually, because of the woman's increased egocentrism, men will no longer be of interest to her. She will only care about what they will be able to offer to satisfy her pleasure or her vanity. In the end, she will even incur forms of corruption that usually accompany superficiality, namely, a practical and superficial lifestyle of a masculine type that has perverted her nature and thrown her into the same male pit of work, profits, frantic activity, and politics. The same holds true for the results of the Western emancipation of women, which is on its way to infecting the rest of the world faster than a plague. Traditional women are the absolute woman, and giving herself, in her living for another, and wanting to be only for another being with simplicity and purity fulfilled herself, belonged to herself, displayed her own heroism, and even became superior to ordinary men. Modern woman in wanting to be for herself has destroyed herself with. The personality she so much yearned for is killing all semblance of female personality in her. It is easy to foresee what will become of the relationship between the sexes, even from a material point of view. Here too, like in magnetism, the higher and stronger the creative spark, the more radical the polarity, the more a man is a man, the more a woman is a woman. What could possibly go on between these mixed beings lacking all contact with the forces of their deepest nature? Between these beings for whom sex is reduced to the physiological plane, between these beings who, in the deepest recesses of their souls, are neither men nor women, or who are masculine women or feminine men, and who claim to have reached full sexual emancipation while truly having only regressed, all relationships are destined to have an ambiguous and crumbling character. The karma promiscuities and morbid, intellectual sympathies such as are commonplace in the new communist realism. In other words, modern women will be affected by neurotic complexes and all the other complexes upon which Freud constructed a science that is truly a sign of our times. The possibilities of the world of the emancipated woman are not dissimilar. The avant-garde of this world, North America and Russia, are already present and give interesting and very meaningful testimonies to this fact. All this cannot but have repercussions on an order of things that goes way beyond what our contemporaries, because of their recklessness, will ever suspect.